Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and you're invited to join me at my new digital fan club on Popbase. On the Popbase app, you can play with exclusive content that I created, compete for rewards and win collectibles in an experience hosted by Digital Me. Our creator community grows fast with daily content drops to keep you busy. And if you've been keeping up with the contest that's currently running, then you'll know that today is the last day to enter to win a Nintendo Switch Lite and Dead by Daylight. You can download the app on the App Store or by clicking on the link below on your mobile device. So, what are you waiting for? See you on Pop Base, people! I work at a gas station in rural Pennsylvania. It's a boring job, but it's pretty easy and it pays all right. A few weeks ago, this new guy started. I call him Jeremy. Jeremy's weird. He's about 25 or 26. And he hardly speaks, but he's got the creepiest laugh I've ever heard. My boss and I have both noticed this, but it's never been a problem. There's not much that we can do about it. Customers have never complained about him, and he's always done his job fairly well. Up until a few weeks ago, anyway. That's when things started going missing. Employee theft can be a problem at any business that sells consumer goods, and there's only one person working at a time at this gas station. It's a pretty small place. About two weeks ago, my boss started noticing that we were short on motor oil. At first, it was a few containers at a time. Then, entire shelves and boxes from the back room. Pretty soon, entire shipments would be gone the day after we got them. And it would always be right after Jeremy's shifts. My boss has checked the security camera tapes from every single night that he worked. But he could never catch him in the act. Jeremy would lock up at closing. Then the motor oil would be gone the next day. My boss usually takes the tapes home with him to try to catch Jeremy stealing. But his daughter had a softball game last night, so he asked me to watch the tapes for him. He offered to pay me overtime, under the table, so obviously I took the offer. But there are three cameras, so he gave me three different tapes to check. I figured it would be a long night, but I'm trying to save up for a vacation, so I really needed the money. I took the tapes home, popped them in an old VCR, and sat back. Two days ago, the last time he worked, Jeremy started at 4 p.m., Everything seemed pretty normal at first. He counted up his drawer, switched off with a girl who had worked before him, and waited for a customer. The first person who came in was Mrs. Templeton. The timestamp on the video read 4.03. It was regular. As she picked up her cigarettes and a newspaper and paid with a 20. Nothing unusual here. Next customer was some local guy named Ron. He drives a motorcycle, usually comes in every few days. He filled up his tank, got a big bag of beef jerky, paid with his credit card, and left. Next was some guy with a cowboy hat. I'd never seen him before. But we get plenty of strangers passing through. It's like any gas station. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel, paid with a $100 bill, and went on his way. I sat back and I sighed. The only thing more boring than doing this job is watching someone else do it. My boss's offer was enough to keep me watching, though. So I left the tape on. Everything seemed pretty normal. I had a feeling that if Jeremy were stealing motor oil, he knew we were suspicious of him by now. I didn't expect him to be dumb enough to let us catch him on camera. Things stayed boring and routine until about 5 o'clock. At 5.03, Mrs. Templeton came back in. She must have forgot something, but she didn't. She bought the same pack of cigarettes as before. The same newspaper. She paid with another 20. That's odd, I thought, but then again, she's a little absent-minded. I thought Jeremy should have told her, since she already got her smokes, but it's not against the rules to sell somebody the same thing twice. And that's when Ron came in again. He bought another tank of gas for his motorcycle again. I later checked the outdoor camera because I thought maybe he like, had another car he wanted to fill up. And the same pack of beef jerky. He paid with his credit card again. No big deal. I figured this was just a weird coincidence. Mrs. Templeton is forgetful. Ron probably owns more than one Harley. And that's when the guy in the cowboy hat came back in. I felt a chill run down my spine. Don't get diesel. Don't get diesel. I found myself whispering to my empty living room. But he did. He got $40 worth of diesel fuel, and he paid with another $100 bill. Every move he made was identical to his first visit, right down to the way that he scratched his nose before he walked out. Either the guy is rich and he owns a lot of trucks and just moved into town or something really bizarre was happening. I kept watching. Every customer for the next hour was the same as before. Every single one. I was seriously freaked out, and then at 6.03, Mrs. Templeton walked back in. She bought her cigarettes and newspaper again and paid with the 20 again. 
I thought I was going to lose it. I, I only watched another half hour before I started fast-forwarding through the rest. It was all the same. Every customer would come in at the exact same time, exactly one hour apart. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay, that, that sneaky Jeremy had messed with the tapes. He had run a loop of his first hour of business over and over. That wasn't the case. There were windows around the cash register area that the camera covers. and I, I watched. I watched the sunlight fade as the time ran on. Jeremy's routine didn't loop over. He swept, mopped, restocked, and did all his duties, exactly how you would expect. But the same customers kept coming in. I was panicked at this point. Something was seriously wrong with what I was seeing, and I had no explanation for it. I skipped ahead, and when he locked up and walked out to his car, he hadn't stolen anything, but I kept watching, just to make sure. I fast-forwarded one last time to about midnight, and exactly, at exactly 12.03, out of nowhere, Jeremy's face popped up on camera. I don't mean he moved his head into view. I mean that one second the store was empty, the next second his face was all I could see. He wasn't looking at the camera, he was looking at me. I, I was sure of it. I screamed and I fumbled for the remote, but by the time I grabbed it, he was gone. Just as soon as he had left. One frame he was there, next he wasn't. My hands were shaking like crazy, but I popped in another tape. The other indoor camera shows the back area, by the cash register, and I, I'd be able to see how he got up to put his face in the camera like that. I skipped ahead to 12.03, but there was nothing. I would have been able to see him standing on a chair or something on this tape, but he wasn't there. I didn't see him enter the store at all after he left. It's like, it's like he wasn't really there. He doesn't, doesn't know the security code. There's no, no alarms that were triggered that night after he locked up. What I did see, however, was that at 12.03, the motor oil vanished off the shelf. All of it. Same as Jeremy's face. One second it was there, the next it wasn't. I turned the tape off and I went to bed. But I didn't get a wink of sleep. My body was exhausted right now, but my mind was racing. That tape... That tape was undoubtedly the creepiest, most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life. I work in a few hours. My boss asked me to bring the tapes back in and let him know what I found. But really? Really, what the hell am I going to say? Jeremy works the night shift tonight, directly after me. Plan is for my boss to come in just before I leave and confront him with me. And I'm supposed to be the one who caught him stealing. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I suppose I'll have to show my boss the tapes, but, but I don't want to watch them with him. I never want to see anything like that again. I can't get the image of Jeremy just smiling directly into the camera out of my mind. It was the creepiest look I've ever seen on another human being's face. Anyway. I'll try again to get some last minute sleep before I have to go in and deal with this. I'll let you guys know what happened. Update. 2.49 p.m. Updating from my phone, so apologies in advance for any errors, but my boss just finished watching the last of the tapes. I told him what to expect. You really can't prepare someone for something like that. I mean, he's scared speechless. I still am too, and Jeremy is due to come in at four. We've got a little over an hour to get our stuff together, but neither of us knows what to say to him. Now, he's, is he just like a messed up guy who likes to steal motor oil and scare the hell out of people, or is he, is he something else? I don't know if this is crazy, but does anyone think, does anyone think that he could have anything to do with the time loop? My boss says he never noticed anything like that in the other tapes. The way that he popped up in this one made me think that he knew I would be watching. Like, like he wanted me to see what he could do. Like he, like he was showing off or something. The way he smiled into the camera was like a little kid showing you a sandcastle they just built or something. I don't know. Probably sound crazy. I sure feel that part. I gotta talk to my boss some more. We have to calm ourselves down and figure out how to handle this. I'll update again tonight, but I... I have a really bad feeling about how this is going to play out. Update. 4.33 p.m. There's no sign of Jeremy. I tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update. 5.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. I tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update. 6.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. Tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update. 7.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. I tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update. 8.33 p.m. No sign of Jeremy. I tried calling him, but his phone has been disconnected. We're calling the police. Update. 10.58 p.m. Oh my god! Oh my god, I, I just got home and I saw my previous updates. Things uh, things make less sense now than ever. 
Okay, here, here's what here's what I can tell you. Okay, I went to work. Jeremy never showed up. My boss and I decided to call the police, as as you're as you're well aware. Uh, okay, when I when I picked up the phone to call though, the sun went out. I I don't. I'm not making that up, okay? That's that's what I thought happened. Apparently, I blacked out for exactly five hours because when I looked at the clock, it was it was 9.33. I think I got stuck in, in Jeremy's time loop. And then I snapped out of it at the exact point I blacked out. If that, if that makes any sense. But that's, that's when things got really weird, okay? My boss was right next to me when I blacked out, ready to corroborate my story to the cops. And when I came to, the phone was in my hand, but it was dead. Not even dial tone. My boss was still right there, but he wasn't moving. He was standing up, but he was frozen. And I looked at the clock, and it wasn't moving. And the second hand was stuck on the 12. It was 9.33 exactly. The clock on the counter, the, the computer screen, wasn't moving either. My phone was frozen. There was, there was even a customer at the register waiting for my boss to get him cigarettes. And that would have been his fifth pack of the day. So I got the hell out of there. I didn't lock up. I didn't turn the lights out. And uh, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't grab the security tapes to upload to the internet. Believe me, that was the last thing that was on my mind. The gas station is on a major highway, and cars are parked all along, except they, they weren't parked. Okay, they were frozen. The people inside were sitting still as wax statues. I got in my car, I prayed that it would start, and thankfully it did. And about halfway home, time started up again. The static from the radio turned into music, like, like it was supposed to be. And from what I could tell by listening to the host talk in between songs, no one noticed that the time was frozen, or whatever had happened. I was the only one. Well, I'm sure that Jeremy noticed as well. I have no idea where he is or what he's doing. And I'm hiding in my room. I'm calling the police again in the morning. I don't know if I ever got through them before, but if I did, whether they took me seriously or not, I'm scared for my life at this point. I'll update tomorrow if I can. Final update. 10.33 a.m. So I finally fell asleep last night around 4. I have no idea how I did it. I guess exhaustion finally got the best of me. This morning I woke up to my phone ringing. It was my boss. He'd been calling me since about six. He woke up in time and turned back on last night and immediately called the cops. They came by to see what was wrong. He told them everything. The police around here are all small time guys. They were more concerned with the missing motor oil than anything. My boss figured that he'd take it. You know, as long as he had their attention, they decided to go look for Jeremy. So we keep all our employee applications on file. And since Jeremy just started working here, his was easy to find. They checked the address on it and they headed over to his house. And you're not going to believe what they found. The address Jeremy listed on his application was an empty lot. Or at least it is now. And there used to be a house there, but it burned down back in 1993. Being a small town, almost everyone remembers that fire. A family of four used to live there way back when. Rumor has it that they had an estranged son who they never really talked about, but I can't say for sure if that's true. What I can say is true is that after an insurance investigation, the fire was ruled as arson. The entire house was soaked in oil and torched with a Molotov cocktail. The entire family was sleeping when it happened. None of them survived. They never caught the guy who did it. Rumor has it that when they tried to contact the estranged son, no one could find him. Anyway, my boss called and told me this, and I freaked out, and he asked me to come to the gas station. So, what are you, crazy, I said, but he assured me that the cops were there with him. And then he dropped a bomb. The FBI were also in town, and they were going to talk to me one way or another, so I might as well come in. So it was about 7.15, and I wanted to go back to bed, so I, I figured I wouldn't be able to sleep much more anyway. So I went down, four men in suits greeted me, told me to have a seat. We went over everything two or three times until they got all the details down. I told them about Jeremy, the security tapes last night at work, everything. And finally, after finishing, one of the agents says, Oh Christ, we've got another one on our hands. And they made me sign a bunch of papers saying I wouldn't tell anybody what happened. Then they made me sign a bunch of papers saying I wouldn't tell anybody about what happened. So I can't say much more. Okay, I might be breaking the law just by posting this. So I'm home now. See, I'm not sure what to do with myself. The agent's words, when I told him the story, are going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Anyway, I've got to go. So I've got some errands to run today, and then I have to go into work to pick up some tapes. My boss and I think this new guy, Jeremy, he's a complete creep. He's stealing motor oil. 
and I have to watch the security footage to see if I can catch him doing it. I have better things to do, but my boss is paying me overtime under the table, and I'm trying to save up for vacation, so I could really use the money. It should be pretty simple. Oil always goes missing right after his shifts. I figure I'll just watch the tapes, catch him in the act, and that'll be that. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Because this is October, I'm going to make this nice, short, and sweet. If you'd like to help support the show or the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. If you'd like to get yourself some new Halloween and creepypasta-inspired teas, you can head over to etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And if you want to catch me... Creeps McPasta and Mew during our live Halloween tour around the southern U.S., head over to creepypasta.showfetti.com. That's creepypasta.s-h-o-f-e-t-t-i.com. Hang on to your hats, kids, because this year is a 31-day Halloween countdown. Happy Halloween and sweet dreams. Last year I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local paper looking for imaginative people looking to make good money. And since it was the only ad that week that I was remotely qualified for, I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me that all I had to do is stay in a room, alone, with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. It seemed easy enough, and I'd agreed to do it as long as they told me how much I'd be paid. And the next day I began. They brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed, and then attached sensors to my head and hooked them to a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualizing my double again, and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I would visualize my double moving around, or try to interact with him, and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room. I had trouble with it for the first few days. It was more controlled by any sort of daydreaming I'd done before. I'd imagine my double for a few minutes and grow distracted. But by the fourth day, I could manage to keep him present for the entire six hours. They told me I was doing very well. The second week, they gave me a different room with uh, wall-mounted speakers. They told me they wanted to see if I could still keep the tulpa with me in spite of distracting stimuli. The music was discordant, ugly, unsettling. It made the process a little more difficult, but I managed nonetheless. The next week, they played even more unsettling music, punctuated with shrieks and feedback loops. It sounded like an old-school modem dialing up guttural voices speaking in some foreign language. I just laughed it off. I was a pro by then. After about a month, I started to get bored. To liven things up, I started interacting with my doppelganger. We'd have conversations or play rock, paper, scissors, or... I'd imagine him juggling or breakdancing or whatever caught my fancy. I asked the researchers if my foolishness would advertly affect their study, but they encouraged me. So I played and communicated, and that was fun for a while. And then it got a little strange. I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. I'd said my date was wearing a yellow top, and he told me it was a green one. I, I thought about it for a second, and I realized he was right. It, it creeped me out, and after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You know on some level that you were wrong, and you subconsciously corrected yourself. Now what had been creepy was suddenly cool. I was talking to my subconscious. It took some practice, but I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books that I'd read once, years before, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. It was awesome. And that was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it almost seemed odd not to see him. So whenever I was bored, I'd visualize my double. Eventually, I started doing it all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I imagined him when I was hanging out with friends or visiting my mom. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak aloud to him, so I was able to carry out conversations with him, and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything I'd forgotten, he'd also seem more in touch with me than I did at times. 
He had an uncanny graft of the minutia of body language that I didn't even realize I was picking up on. For example, I thought the date I brought him along on was going badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing a little too hard at my jokes and leaning toward me as I spoke, and a bunch of other subtle clues I wasn't consciously picking up on. I listened, and well, let's say that the date went very well. Now, by that time, I'd been at the research center for four months, and he was with me constantly. The researchers approached me one day after my shift and asked me if I stopped visualizing him. I denied it, and they seemed pleased. I silently asked my double if he knew what prompted that, but he just shrugged it off. And so did I. I withdrew a little from the world at that point. See, I, I was having trouble relating to people. It seemed to me that they were, they were so confused and unsure of themselves while I had a manifestation of myself to confer with. It made socializing awkward. Nobody, nobody else seemed aware of the reasons behind their actions. Why some things made them mad, other things made them laugh. They didn't know what moved them, but I did. Or at least, I could ask myself and get an answer. A friend confronted me one day, pounded at the door until I answered it. Came in, fuming, swearing up a storm. You have an answer when I called you. What, what the hell's your problem? I was about to apologize to him and probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night. My tulpa grew furious suddenly. Hit him it said. Before I knew what I was doing, I had. I heard his nose break. He fell to the floor. He came up swinging. We beat each other up and down my apartment. I was more furious than I had ever been, and I was not merciful. Knocked him to the ground, gave him two savage kicks to the ribs. That's when he fled, hunched over, sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later, but I told him that he'd been the instigator, since he wasn't around to refute me. Flipped me off with a warning. My tulpa was grinning the entire time. I spent the night crowing about my victory, sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning when I was checking out my black eye and cut lip in the mirror that I remembered what had set me off. My double was the one who'd grown furious, not me. I'd been feeling guilty, a little ashamed, but he'd goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course, knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone anymore, he told me. And I felt my skin crawl. I explained all this to the researchers who employed me, but they, they just laughed it off. You can't be scared of something you're imagining, one told me. My double stood beside him and nodded his head, and then smirked at me. I tried to take their words to heart, but over the next few days I found myself growing more and more anxious around my tulpa, and it seemed that he was changing. He looked taller, more menacing, his eyes twinkled with mischief, and I saw malice in his constant smile. No job was worth losing my mind over, I decided. If he was out of control, I'd put him down. I was so used to him at that point that visualizing him was an automatic response, so I, I started trying my damnedest to not visualize him. That took a few days, but it started to work somewhat. I could get rid of him for hours at a time, but every time he came back, and he seemed worse. His skin seemed ashen, his teeth more pointed. He hissed and gibbered and threatened and swore. The discordant music I'd been listening to for months seemed to accompany him everywhere, even when I was at home. I'd relax and slip up, no longer concentrating on not seeing him, and there he'd be, and that howling noise with him. I was still visiting the research center and spending my six hours there. I needed the money. I thought they weren't aware that I was now actively not visualizing my tulpa. I was wrong. After my shift one day, about five and a half months in, two impressive men grabbed me and restrained me, and someone in a lab coat jabbed a hypodermic needle into my body. I woke up from my stupor back in the room, strapped to a bed, music blaring with my doppelganger standing over me, cackling. He hardly looked human anymore. His features were twisted, his eyes sunken into their sockets and filmed over like a corpse's. He was much taller than me, but hunched over. His hands were twisted, the fingernails were like talons. He was, in short terrifying. I tried to will him away, but I could I just couldn't. I couldn't seem to concentrate. He giggled and tapped the IV in my arm. I thrashed at my restraints as best I could, but I could hardly move at all. They're pumping you full of the good stuff, I think. How's the mind? All fuzzy. He leaned closer and closer as he spoke, and I gagged. His breath smelled like spoiled meat. I tried to focus, but I couldn't banish him. The next few weeks were terrible. 
Every so often, someone in a doctor's coat would come in and inject me with something or force feed me a pill. They kept me dizzy and unfocused and sometimes left me hallucinating or delusional. My thought forms were still present, constantly mocking me. He, he interacted with or perhaps caused my delusions. I hallucinated that my mother was there, scolding me, and then that he cut her throat and her, her blood showered me. It was so real that I could taste it. The doctors never spoke to me. I begged at times. I, I screamed, hurled invectives, demanded answers. They never spoke to me. They, they may have talked to my tulpa, my, my personal monster. I'm not sure. I was so doped up and confused that it may have just seemed more like more delusions. But I, I remember them talking with him. I could convince that he was the real one. I was the thought form. And he encouraged that line of thought at times. He mocked me at others. Another thing that I pray was a delusion was that he could touch me. More than that, he could hurt me. He poked and prodded at me if he felt I wasn't paying close enough attention to him. Once he grabbed my throat and he squeezed until I told him that I loved him. Another time he slashed my forearm with one of his talons and ice. I still have a scar. Most days I can convince myself that I injured myself, and I, I just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. And then one day, well, he was telling me a story about how he was, he was going to gut everyone that I love, starting with my sister. He paused. A curious look crossed his face. He reached out and he touched my head like a mother used to do when I had a fever. He stayed still for a long moment, then he smiled. All thoughts are creative, he told me. Then he walked out the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and I passed out. I awoke unrestrained, shaking. I made my way to the door and I found it unlocked. And I walked out into the empty hallway and then, then I ran. I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. And there I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually. I don't remember how. I, I locked the door. I shoved a dresser against it. I took a long shower and I slept for a day and a half. And nobody came for me in the night. Nobody came for me the next day or the one after that. It was over. I'd spent a week locked in that room, but, but it felt like a century. I'd withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody, nobody had even known I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The research center was empty paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given them were aliases. Even the money I'd received was apparently untraceable. I had recovered. As much as one can. I don't leave the house much. And I have panic attacks, and I do. I cry a lot. I don't sleep much, and my nightmares are terrible. It's over, I tell myself. I survived. I used the concentration those bastards had taught me to convince myself. It works sometimes. But not today, though. Three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. It's been a tragedy. My sister is the latest victim in a killing spree, the police say. The perpetrator mugs his victims, and he guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was as lovely a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. And I was a little distracted, though. All I could hear was the music coming from somewhere distant discordant, unsettling stuff that sounds like feedback and shrieking and a modem dialing up. I hear it still. A little louder now. Those who dream by day are cognizant of many things that escape those who dream only at night. It's Edgar Allan Poe. Go to bed. Wait for the Sandman. Even as it came out of James's mouth, it seemed to him a strange thing to say. He wasn't sure why he had, but for some reason it worked. Daniel went to bed. The next morning, though, he asked, What does the Sandman look like? James was making breakfast. Daniel sat at the table, short legs swinging under his chair. Nothing really, James said. It's just an expression. What does it mean? Oh, it's just something people say put a plate of eggs in front of Daniel and kissed him on the top of his head. He thought that would be the end of it. Until he saw the Sandman for himself. He was getting ready for bed and stopped by Daniel's room to check on him while he slept, as he often did. 
It was such a routine precaution that when he saw a pale, naked man sitting on the edge of Daniel's bed, rocking back and forth, it took a moment for him to process what he was seeing. He reacted the way any father would, of course. He ran into the room screaming, and for a moment, he thought about attacking the intruder, but then the man on the bed. That's what James saw, that it wasn't really a man. He reacted the way any father would, of course. He ran into the room screaming, and for a moment, he thought about attacking the intruder, but then the man on the bed turned. And that's when James saw that it wasn't really a man. It was a pale, slithery thing, hairless and warped, its joints turned the wrong way and its body out of shape with itself. When it moved, it was like an insane marionette dancing on a stage. James froze. The skittering thing watched him. He felt spreading warmth. And only when he remembered that, James was still there in bed, staring at the broken-shaped thing sitting a foot away did he regain the courage to move. He grabbed Daniel and he ran. In the hall, he turned to see if the thing would follow him. But it didn't. For a moment, it watched. And then... Moving like a stop-motion nightmare, it crawled to the window and jumped out, leaving only the billowing curtain to mark its passing. James had trouble talking to the police. He reported a break-in, but when asked to describe the intruder, he didn't know what to say. How could he make the ordinary man in the blue uniform sitting at his kitchen table while two of his colleagues searched the house understand a thing like he'd seen? He couldn't even understand it himself. To make it worse, Daniel's memory did not correspond to James's. He described an ordinary-looking burglar, a man in a mask, he said. James thought about it. Had it been a mask? No, it would have been a full costume, an elaborate one. Something like, something like they would use for a movie. And that would not explain the way it moved. But in the end, he simply echoed his son's testimony. A man in a mask, he said. A burglar. The lie unsettled him almost as much as what had happened. The doctor said Daniel wasn't hurt and showed no signs of molestation. James was relieved. They stayed at a motel for a couple of nights until they felt ready to come home, and then James had a new security system installed, along with bars on the windows. He didn't like the sight of them in Daniel's room, but it seemed like the only thing to do. James was frightened that first night back in the house, but Daniel, strangely, was not. When asked if he felt okay sleeping alone, he just said, yes. In the end, it was James who fought himself, wishing that he was not sleeping alone. He was up all night listening for the sound of anything moving in the house, although he had convinced himself that his memory was faulty and that it had been a normal, albeit probably deeply disturbed man in his son's room. When he closed his eyes, even for a moment, he pictured bloodless skin, twisted in human face. He found himself wondering, why my house? Why my family? He knew, of course, that there didn't have to be a reason. But still, he wondered. Two weeks later, Daniel stopped talking. James didn't notice at first. Kids went through quiet phases sometimes, but eventually he tried to get Daniel to talk, and he wouldn't. Eventually, it became clear that he couldn't. Back to the doctor they went. Nothing wrong with him that he could see. It was the diagnosis. Was it the trauma, James asked? Could be, they said. Sometimes these things come on late. Children can be a mystery, even to those who know them best. They recommended a child psychologist whom James couldn't afford. He could not, for that matter, even afford the bill they were giving him right now. Nothing seemed to help. Daniel would write out answers to questions sometimes, but never more than a yes or no. When James would ask him what was wrong, or, or if he'd seen or heard anything that frightened him, Daniel would only stare. He seemed furtive, bemused. James found himself missing the sound of his son's voice. Sometimes he wanted to hear it so bad that he ached, but it seemed that Daniel would not talk again until he was ready. James had other things to worry about. He was convinced, beyond reason, that the intruder was not really gone. Though the alarm never went off and the locks and bars remained undisturbed, he was sure that he heard movement in the night. Not normal movement. It was a sound like a 
like a huge snake slithering through the house. When he heard it, he imagined horrible things. Nothing was ever there when he went to investigate, though he often thought he glimpsed something just out the corner of his eye. A pale foot, a misshapen shadow that would slink away as soon as he turned. He rarely slept, and when he did, he had haunted dreams. Soon he realized he had not left the house in weeks except to go to the bank to buy groceries. He felt hemmed in. With Daniel acting mute, he hadn't had an actual conversation with anyone in weeks, so he called his mother. The connection was bad, her voice sounded faint, on the verge of not being there at all. I guess I'm okay, Ma, he said, pausing to wipe the sweat from his palms and then make sure that he could hear Daniel playing in the next room. But things have been a little rough. We had a break-in. Oh, how awful, Mom said. Did they take anything? Nah, just ran off. It was weird, though. I haven't really felt comfortable since then. Are you still working at the hospital? No, Ma. I, I left last year. You know that. Oh. Well, have you been getting out? What about that nice woman that you were seeing last year? The one who played the piano? James scowled. She was always asking that kind of thing. Didn't she know how hard it was being a single father? But he didn't have the time. He was, he was about to say so, and something... Something made him pause. Ma, is, is there anyone else on the line? No, I, I don't think so. James was sure he heard it. A, a short, gasping sound of someone trying to hold their breath and failing. A cold feeling crept across the back of his neck. You're sure no one's listening on your other phone? Dear, there is no other phone. I, I'm on the cell. That's why the service is so bad. Then what is... James stopped. If the sound wasn't coming from her end, then... He dropped the phone and raced to the hall. The extension hung on its hook, undisturbed. Heart pounding, he hurtled into the garage. The spare phone sat on the workbench. No one in sight. But could they have been? Could someone have been here all along listening to his phone call and then and then slithered away. Might they be here even now? The next day he took out the extra phone extensions. He even filled in the jacks with rubber cement. Daniel watched him work, eyes curious, but James offered no explanation. He began giving Daniel a light physical exam every week. His CNA training was a little rusty after a year on disability, but you never really forget. It was an absurd thing to do, of course. Even if there was a physical cause for Daniel's behavior, it would be nothing he could discover this way. And he was aware on some level that it was compulsive behavior. Nevertheless, it made him feel better. One morning, James set the diaphragm of the stethoscope against Daniel's chest, but he couldn't locate a heartbeat. He moved his hand in search of the right spot, to no avail. Then to test it, he listened to his own heartbeat. He came through steady and clear, but when he checked Daniel again, he didn't hear anything. A thought came, unbidden to him from the tin man in the Wizard of Oz, whose chest was emptied like a kettle. A sick feeling roiled in his stomach. He, he threw the stethoscope down and grabbed Daniel by the shoulders, looking into his face. Daniel stared back with bright eyes. He even smiled a little in the corners of his mouth. James felt the tinge of tears. He, he's... He swept his son up in his arms and hugged him, and Daniel hugged back, and then James put his shirt back on him and, and sent him to play. The stethoscope, he decided, was broken. He threw it in the trash. Things got worse. James's terrors were no longer relegated to the long hours of the night. Now it seemed that some creeping, some skittering and scuttling, some unknown noise in some dark corner or another filled every second of his day. The thought of how big the house really was started to weigh on him. There were so many rooms he wasn't in at any given time, so many places someone or something could be. He imagined strange figures occupying the rest of his home when he wasn't around, melting into the walls or merging with the shadows whenever he turned on a light or opened a door. How would he know if they were there? How would he ever know? Soon he didn't even have to be outside of a room to imagine it. When he walked up the stairs, he pictured pale figures lurking beneath them. When he went down the hall, he pictured a crawling thing slithering behind the walls, shadowing his every step. If he sat too long in the same chair, he imagined that it was right behind him, and he was never comfortable when he turned around and found 
nothing there. As he could only guess, that meant it. it had moved swiftly, silently, behind him once again. Wherever he was not looking right now, that was where he imagined it to be. He was losing his mind. He knew the only thing that helped him cling to sanity was that Daniel seemed undisturbed other than his muteness. His behavior was perfectly normal. And whenever he seemed to sense that his father was troubled, he would hug him, or squeeze his hand, or even smile. Sometimes when he left the room, James cried. One night he found himself creeping around the house with no lights on at two o'clock in the morning. If the intruding thing had taken to violating his daydream activities, then he would get revenge by confronting it on its own terms. The night. And really, night was no more frightening to him than day. They were almost interchangeable. He padded barefoot down the halls, up the stairs, in and out of disused rooms. Sometimes he stopped to listen, hoping to locate it by sound. It was stealthy. A creeping thing, he knew, but it was awkward at times, and it couldn't always keep its strangely shaped limbs from making their distinct, irregular footsteps. The smallest noise would give it away. There was one room he suspected it spent most of its time in. The spare bedroom. Not a bedroom at all, really, more like a closet just large enough to accommodate a bed if one were so inclined. It was unpainted and uncarpeted and drafty. He always meant to fix it up. He didn't come in here very often because he disliked the bare, unused look of it. It made him think of a partially dissected corpse. He came in now, though. If the thing made its nest in any one place in the house, this would be it. Of course, there was nothing there now. But that didn't mean that there was nothing there. He cursed, running a hand through his sweat-damp hair. What was he missing? How did it hide from him? What was its secret? He peered into the room's empty corners, one by one, getting his face a few inches from the plaster and floorboard so that he could, he could be certain, certain, that there was no space for it to conceal itself. The light bulb flickered. He froze. My God, he thought, it's, it's on the ceiling. He pictured it crawling above him like a huge pale lizard. That's how it gets around, he thought. That's how it escaped. Anytime I should have cornered it, it just scuttles up the wall and hides right over my head. He imagined it dangling down behind him like a spider. If he turned around, he thought it would be there, hanging with its face right next to mine. He held his breath. He didn't want to turn around, but he had no choice. It was between him and the door. With a quiet sob, he rounded on his heels. Of course, he was alone. There was no man on the ceiling. He checked. Twice. Maybe it crawled out and was waiting for him in the hall, but when he checked there, the coast was once again clear. It should have been a relief, but it was not. I mean, after all, it had to be in here somewhere. If the ceiling was not its trick, that meant it was something else, something even more strange, even more clever. He went to Daniel's room. He had not stopped checking on him at night like he always had. This time, though, rather than open the door, he listened at it first, pressing his ear against the, the grain of the cheap wood and holding his breath, terrified that he would hear a skittering sound on the other side of the barrier. What he heard instead shocked him more. Daniel was talking to someone. James recoiled for a second and then... Then he caught his breath and he all but kicked the door in. Daniel was already awake indeed, sitting up in bed, but he was not saying anything now. The light flashed on and James stalked halfway into the room before stopping. Suddenly torn. What did he want more? To confirm that his son could speak again or to find whomever he was speaking to? The creak of a door hinge settled the matter for him. He ran to the closet and threw it open. There was nothing inside, or at least, at least nothing that shouldn't be there. He swept aside clothes on their hangers, but nothing was hiding behind them. He dragged a toy box out and emptied it on the floor. Nothing. He combed along the bare walls and floor, and, and yes, the ceiling, pushing aside every last bit of rubbish and stray knick-knack so that he could be sure, absolutely sure, that nothing was hiding. All the while, Daniel watched him. After a few minutes, James was panting and covered in sweat, and the closet was bare, and there was neither intruder nor answers inside. It struck him as funny somehow. Somehow he had started to laugh very quietly. He kicked his son's toys out of the way as he went to sit down on the bed, dazed. He became aware all at once of several things, first being that he had not slept in days, 
nowhere near his right mind. The second was how close he'd come to really losing it for good. Tomorrow, he decided, they would both sleep until the afternoon. And when they did wake up, he and Daniel would get out of this creaky old house. No more staying cooped up like prisoners. No more checkups. No more dreams about monsters. He'd even take the bars off the windows. It was time to get back to living like real people again. It was time to... James saw it. When he brushed a hand through Daniel's hair, he pulled Daniel a little too roughly closer. His son acquiesced the examination without fidgeting or complaint as James pawed the side of his head, hoping that what he was seeing would somehow stop being a pair. He stared and stared and until he ached from not blinking, but there was... There was no denying what was right in front of his eyes. Daniel was missing an ear. No. No, he realized, with, with mounting nausea. Both ears. There was no injury, no, no incision, no mark where they should have been. Simply smooth, blank flesh, as, as blank as Daniel's quiet, unperturbed demeanor. James swept him up in his arms and ran to the hall. He was not sure where he was going or, or what he was meant to do when he got there. He just knew that there was... Now nothing more important than getting his son out of that house, but their path was cut off. A naked man sat in the hallway with his back to them. No, no not a man. James recognized its stretched limbs and stooped shoulders. The pale thing squatted on its haunches, rocking back and forth like it was, like it was palaced and almost seemed to be in pain. James hugged his son closer and backed away, and then he heard, then he heard Daniel's voice. Daddy... James turned to Daniel. He heard the voice again. Daddy. But Daniel's lips hadn't moved. James looked back at the hunched figure. Its head jerked when it talked like a tick. Hello, Daddy. James's mouth went dry. It took several tries before he could speak. Don't call me that. It is... This voice's name for you. Go away. Leave my family alone. But I am your family. The longer it talked, the more the voice became distorted and blurred and icy feeling nestled in James's stomach. Who are you? Someone who came to visit. Why here? You invited me. James's heart thudded against the inside of his chest. Why? I had something you wanted. James licked his dry lips. You're lying. You're lying. You don't have anything I want. I want you to leave. I want you to leave and never come back. Who is Daniel's mother? James blinked. What? Who is Daniel's mother? The hell kind of question is that? How old is Daniel? James blinked again. The thing's voice caused a, a pinching pain in the center of his forehead. Stop! Stop asking me these things! When is Daniel's birthday? I, I, don't, I don't know. What is his middle name? Shut up! What was his first word? I said shut up! James wanted to tear the thing apart with his bare hands, only the heaviness of Daniel in his arms kept him where he was. You were alone. You wanted a son. So I made one for you. James's hands began to shake. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Made out of what? Out of myself. James's stomach turned over. But now I need those parts back. 
Daniel picked at James' shoulder to get his attention. Something was strange about Daniel's face. Danny? Danny, open your eyes. Daniel scrunched his eyes shut tighter. Open your eyes. Danny? Danny, open your eyes! Daniel shook his head, trying to refuse, but he couldn't hold it forever. Eventually, his eyelids flicked up and James... James saw the truth. Daniel's eyes were gone. James almost dropped them. For a second, he wanted to throw his son down so that he could stop looking into those empty holes in his face. Daniel opened his mouth as if to speak, but of course, of course he had no voice. He's coming back to be part of me again. No. No, no, no. Give him back. Give him back. I cannot. It's been too long. I warned you this would happen. You're lying. You're lying. You're lying. Give me some, give me my son back. I do not lie. I warn you. He could not exist forever. But you do not remember. You can only remember what I want you to. You forgot. All the time. We've talked. Daniel felt like a doll or an empty bag. His hair was falling out, disappearing before he could touch the ground. His hands vanished into his sleeves. His feet rolled up inside his pant cuffs. James cradled the tiny, shapeless thing. Tears streaming down his face, and soon, soon he held a pile of empty clothes. And then those two were gone. He looked around the house. Toys disappeared. Photos vanished from their frames. Daniel's little shoes were no longer by the door. James turned towards Daniel's room and he confronted a wall there where the door should be. He grew up the blank space, fingertips scrambling. He hit his head against the wall. The pain didn't feel real. Why did you do this? It was what you wanted. And I learned so much. This is impossible. People who ask, people will wonder, the police, the hospital, the people in our neighborhood. They have already forgotten him. They only remembered what I wanted them to. Like you! James pressed his hands to his aching skull. Will I at least remember him after this? You can try, but your mind will fail you now that everything he was is part of me again. James sat on the floor, looking at the blank wall. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the thing creep toward him and even felt its wet hand on his shoulder, but he did not look at it. If I won't remember any of this, he said, then why tell me? Because... A father should know. And then, James was alone. Abigail worried about James sometimes. When they met a year ago, he said that he'd never been married and he'd never had kids. But there was a certain pained expression he assumed when he said that last part. Abigail knew that look. She'd met parents who lost children before. You recognize it. And there were other things about him that worried her, too. Sometimes she would find him staring at a particular spot on the wall, brow furrowed in concentration. He didn't seem to realize he was doing it. And, of course, there was, there was the insomnia and the sleepwalking to consider, too. There was a lot to worry about. But she loved him all the same. James still said he'd never had kids. Neither had she. She long wanted one, but it was impossible. She worried that James wouldn't stay with a woman who couldn't be a mother, though he constantly assured her that it was not so. There were times, and more and more often of late, they were the nights when James took to sleepwalking, and even Abigail imagined that she heard strange scuttling noises in the house. Saw impossible shapes in dark corners. When she thought that she would do anything, absolutely anything, if it meant to have a little daughter for she and James to raise. 
and at those moments, she became truly afraid. But she never knew why. Let me start off by saying that Peter Terry was addicted to heroin. And that we were friends in college and continued to be after I graduated. Notice that I said, I. He dropped out after two years of barely cutting it. After I moved out of the dorms and into a small apartment, I didn't see Peter as much. We'd talk online every now and then. Aim was king in the pre-Facebook years. There was a period where he wasn't online for about five weeks straight. I wasn't worried. He was pretty notoriously a flake and a drug addict. So I assumed that he just stopped caring. And then one night, I saw him log online. Before I could initiate a conversation, he sent me a message. David, man, we need to talk. That was when he told me about the No End House. They got that name because no one had ever reached the final exit. The rules were pretty simple and cliche. Reach the final room of the building and you win $500. There were nine rooms in all. The house was located outside the city, roughly four miles from my house. Apparently Peter had tried and failed. He was a heroine and who knows what the hell else addict, so I figured the drugs got the best of him and he wigged out at a paper ghost. He told me it would be too much for anyone, that it was unnatural. I didn't believe him. I told him I would check it out the next night, and no matter how hard he tried to convince me otherwise, $500 sounded too good to be true. I had to go. I set out the following night. When I arrived, I immediately noticed something strange about the building. Have you ever seen or read something that shouldn't be scary? But for some reason, a chill crawls up your spine. I walked towards the building, and the feeling of uneasiness only intensified as I opened the front door. My heart slowed, and I let a relieved sigh leave me as I entered. The room looked like a normal hotel lobby, decorated for Halloween. A sign was posted in place of a worker. It read, Room one this way. Eight more follow. Reach the end. And you win. I chuckled, and I made my way to the first door. The first area was almost laughable. The decor resembled the Halloween aisle of a Kmart, complete with sheet ghosts and animatronic zombies that gave a static growl when you passed by. At the far end was an exit. It was the only door besides the one I entered through. I brushed through the fake spider webs and headed for the second room. I was greeted by fog as I opened the door to room two. The room definitely upped the ante in terms of technology. Not only was there a fog machine, but a bat hung from the ceiling and flew in a circle. Scary. They seemed to have a Halloween soundtrack that one would find in a 99 cent store on loop somewhere in the room. I didn't see a stereo, but I guess they must have used a PA system. I stepped over a few toy rats that wheeled around and walked with a puffed chest across to the next area, reached for the doorknob, and my heart sank to my knees. I didn't want to open that door. The feeling of dread hit me so hard I could barely even think. Logic overtook me. After a few terrified moments, I shook it off and I entered the next room. Room three is when things began to change. On the surface, it looked like a normal room. There was a chair in the middle of the wood-paneled floor. A single lamp in the corner did a poor job of lighting the area, casting a few shadows across the floor and walls. See, that was the problem. Shadows. Plural. With the exception of the chairs, there were others. I had barely walked in the door, and I was already terrified. It, it was at that moment that I knew something wasn't right. I didn't even think as I automatically tried to open the door I came through. It was locked from the other side. That set me off. Was someone locking the doors as I progressed? There was no way. I would have heard them. Was it a mechanical lock? The one that's set automatically? That, maybe. But I was too scared to really think. I turned back to the room and the shadows were gone. The chair's shadows remained, but the others were gone. I slowly began to walk, and I, I used to hallucinate when I was a kid, so I wore off the shadows as a figment of my imagination. I began to feel better as I made it to the halfway point of the room. I looked down as I took my steps, and that's when I saw it. Or didn't see it. My shadow wasn't there. I didn't have time to scream. I ran as fast as I could to the other side, and I flung myself without thinking into the room beyond. The fourth room was possibly the most disturbing. 
As I close the door, all light seemed to be sucked out and put back into the previous room. I stood there, surrounded by darkness, not able to move. I'm, I'm not afraid of the dark. I never have been. But I was absolutely terrified. All sight had left me. I held my hand in front of my face, and if I didn't know what I was doing, I would never have been able to tell. Darkness doesn't describe it. I couldn't hear anything. It was, it was dead silence. When you're in a soundproof room, you can still hear yourself breathing. You could hear yourself being alive. I couldn't. I began to stumble forward after a few moments. My rapid beating heart, the only thing I could feel. There was, there was no door in sight. I wasn't even sure there was one this time. The silence was then broken by a low hum. I felt something behind me. I spun around wildly, but I, I could barely even see my own nose. I knew it was there, though. Regardless of how dark it was, I knew something was there. The hum grew louder. Closer. It seemed to surround me, but I knew. Whatever was causing the noise, it was... It was in front of me. Inching closer. I took a step back. I never felt that kind of fear. I, I can't really describe true fear. I wasn't even scared. I was... I wasn't scared I was going to die. I was scared of what the alternative was. I was afraid of what this thing had in store for me. And then the lights flashed for a second, and I saw it. Nothing. I, I saw nothing. I know I saw nothing there. The, the room was again plunged into darkness, and the hum became a wild screech. I screamed in protest. I couldn't hear this goddamn sound for another minute. I ran backwards away from the noise and fumbled for the door handle. I turned, and I fell into room five. Before I describe room five, you have to understand something. I am not a drug addict. I have, I've had no history of drug abuse or any sort of psychosis, short of the childhood hallucinations that I mentioned earlier, and those were only when I was really tired or just waking up. I entered the no-end house with a clear head. After falling in from the previous room, my view of room five was from my back, looking up at the ceiling. What I saw didn't scare me. It simply surprised me. Trees had grown into the room and towered above my head. The ceilings in this room were taller than the others, which made me think I was in the center of the house. I got up off the floor, I dusted myself off, I took a look around. It was definitely the biggest room of them all. I couldn't even see the door from where I was. Various brush and trees must have blocked my line of sight with the exit. Up to this point, I figured the rooms were, were going to get scarier, but this was a paradise compared to the last room. I also assumed whatever was in room four stayed back there. I was incredibly wrong. As I made my way deeper into the room, I began to hear what one would hear if they were in a forest. Chirping bugs, the occasional flap of birds, seemed to be the only company in this room. That was the thing that bothered me the most. I, I heard the bugs and the other animals, but, but I didn't see any of them. I began to wonder how big this house was. From the outside, when I first walked up to it, it looked like a regular house. It was, it was definitely on the bigger side, but this was almost a full forest in here. The canopy covered my view of the ceiling, but I assumed it was still there, however high it was. I couldn't see any walls either. The only way I knew I was still inside was the, the floor matched the other rooms. Standard dark wood paneling. I kept walking, hoping that the next tree I passed would reveal the door. After a few moments of walking, I heard a mosquito fly under my arm. I shook it off. I kept going. A second later, I felt up ten more land on my skin in different places. I felt them crawl up and down my arms and legs. A few made their way across my face. I flailed wildly to get them all off me, but they, they, they just kept crawling. I looked down and I let out a muffled scream. More of a whimper, to be honest. I, I didn't see a single bug. Not one bug was on me, but I could feel them. I, I could feel them crawling. I heard them fly by my face and sting my skin, but I, I couldn't see a single one. I dropped to the ground and I began to roll wildly. I was, I was desperate. I hated bugs, especially ones I couldn't see or touch, but these bugs, these bugs could touch me. They were everywhere. I, I began to crawl. I had no idea where I was going. The entrance was nowhere in sight and I still hadn't seen, I still hadn't seen the exit, so I just crawled. My skin wriggled with the presence of those phantom bugs and after what seemed like hours, I found the door. I grabbed the nearest tree. I propped myself up, mindlessly slapping my arms and legs to no avail. I, I tried to run, but I couldn't. My body was exhausted from crawling and dealing with whatever it was that was on me. I took a few shaky steps towards the door, grabbing each tree in the way for support. It was only a few feet away when I heard it. The low hum from before. It was coming from the next room, and it was deeper. I, 
I can almost feel it inside my body, like when you stand next to an amp at a concert, the feeling of the bugs on me lessened as the hum grew louder, and as I placed my hand on the doorknob, the bugs were completely gone, but I, I couldn't bring myself to turn the knob. I knew that if I let go, the bugs would return, and there was no way I would make it back to room four. I, I just stood there, my head pressed against the door marked six, and my hand shakily grasping the knob. The hum was so loud. I couldn't even hear myself pretend to think. There was nothing I could do but move on. Room six was next. Room six was hell. I closed the door behind me. My eyes held shut and my ears ringing. The hum was surrounding me. As the door clicked into place, the hum was gone. I opened my eyes in surprise and the door I had shut was gone. It's just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was... The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I came through was gone. The room was identical to room three, the same chair and lamp, but with the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I came in through was gone. As I said before, I have no previous issues in terms of mental instability, but at that moment, I fell into what I now know was insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't make a sound. At first, I scratched softly. The, the wall was tough, but I knew the door was there somewhere. I, I just knew it was. I scratched it where the door was. I clawed at the wall frantically with both hands, my nails being filed down to the skin against the wood. I, I, I fell silently to my knees, the only sound in the room, the incessant scratching against the wall. I, I knew it was there. The door was there. I, I knew it was. It, it just had to be there. I knew if I can get past this wall. Are you all right? I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me and I saw what it was that spoke to me. To this, to this day, I regret ever turning around. There was a little girl. She was wearing a soft white dress that went down to her ankles. She had long blonde hair to the middle of her back and white skin and blue eyes. She was the most frightening thing I'd ever seen. And I know that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. While looking at her, I saw something else. Where she stood, I saw what looked like a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. He was, he was naked from head to toe, but his head was not human. His toes were, were hooves. It, it wasn't the devil, but at that moment, it might as well have been. The form had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying. It was a... Synonymous with the little girl in front of me. They, they were the same form. I, I can't really describe it, but but I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot in that room. But it, 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 was, it was like looking at two separate dimensions. When I saw the girl, I saw the form. And when I saw the form, I saw the girl. I couldn't speak. I, I could barely even see. My mind was revolting against what it was attempting to process. I had been scared before in my life. I had never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth room, but that was, that was before room six. I just stood there staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was, there was no exit. I was trapped here with it. And then, and then it spoke again. David, mm. you should have listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl. But the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound. The voice just kept repeating the sentence over and over in my mind as I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness, yet I couldn't take my eyes off of what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. I, I thought I had passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just, I just wanted it to end. I was on my side, my eyes wide open, and the form staring down at me. Scurrying across the floor in front of me was... One of the battery-powered rats from the second room. The house, the house was... It was toying with me. But for whatever reason, seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed, and I looked around the room. I was getting out of here. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. And I knew this room was hell. And I wasn't ready to take up a residency. At first, first it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room... It wasn't that big, so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. 
The demon still taunted me, the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hands on the floor, I lifted myself up to all four, and then turned to scan the wall behind me. And I saw something I couldn't believe. The form was right in my back, whispering into my mind how I, I shouldn't have come here. I, I felt its breath on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. A large rectangle was scratched into the wood with a small dent chipped away in the center of it. Right in front of my eyes, I saw the large seven I had mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew what it was. R room seven was just beyond that wall where room five was moments ago. I don't know how I had done it. Maybe it was just my state of mind at the time, but I had created the door. I knew I had. In my madness, I had, I had scratched into the wall what I needed the most, and an exit to the next room. Room seven was close. I knew the demon was right behind me, but for some reason, I, it couldn't touch me. I, I, I closed my eyes and I placed both hands on the large seven in front of me, and I, I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me I was never leaving. It told me that this place was the end, but I wasn't going to die. I was going to live there in room six with it. I wasn't. I wasn't. I pushed and I screamed at the top of my lungs and I knew, I knew I was going to push through the wall eventually. I clenched my eyes shut and I screamed and the demon was gone. I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and I was greeted by the room as it was when I entered. Just a chair and a lamp. I couldn't believe it, but I I didn't have time to well. I turned back to the seven and I jumped back slightly when I saw... What I saw was a door. It wasn't the one I had scratched in, but a regular door with a large seven on it. My whole body was shaking. It took me a while to turn the knob. I just stood there for a while, staring at the door. I, I couldn't stay in room six. I couldn't. But if this was only room six, I couldn't imagine what, what seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour. Staring at that seven. And finally, with a deep breath, I twisted the knob. And I opened the door. I stumbled through the door and mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed and I realized where I was. I was outside. Not like not like room five, but actually outside. My, my eyes stung. I, I wanted to cry. I fell to my knees. And I tried, but I couldn't. I, I was finally out of that hell. I didn't even care about the prize that was promised. I turned and I saw that the door I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car. I drove home to get about how nice a shower sounded. I pulled up to my house and I, f I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving no one's house had faded and dread was slowly building in my stomach. I shook it off as a residual from the house and I made my way to the front door. I entered my house and immediately went up to my room. There on my bed was my cat Baskerville. He was the first living thing that I had seen all night, and I, I reached to pet him. He hissed and swiped at my hand. I recoiled in shock. He never acted like that. I thought, whatever. I mean, he's an old cat. I jumped in the shower. I got ready for what I was expecting to be a sleepless night. After my shower, I went to the kitchen to make something to eat. I descended the stairs. I turned into the family room. What I saw would be forever burned into my mind. My parents... They were lying on the ground, naked, covered in blood. They were mutilated to near unidentifiable states. Their limbs were removed, placed next to their bodies. Their heads were placed in their chests, facing me. The most, the most unsettling parts was their expressions. They were smiling as though they were happy to see me. I vomited. I vomited and I, I sobbed there in the living room. I, I, I didn't know what had happened. They, they didn't even live with me at the time. I was a mess. And then I saw it. I saw it. A, a, a door. A door that was never there before. A door with a large eight. Scrawled on it in blood. I was still in the house. I was, I was standing in my family room, but I, w I was in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider as I realized this. They, they weren't my parents, they couldn't be, but they looked exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room behind the mutilated bodies in front of me, and I knew, I knew I had to move on, but at that moment I gave up. 
The smiling faces tore into my mind. They grounded me where I stood. I vomited again and I nearly collapsed. And then... And then the hum returned. It was louder than ever and it filled the house and it shook the walls and the hum compelled me to walk. I... I began to walk slowly, making my way closer to the door and the bodies, and I could barely stand, let alone walk, and the closer I got to my parents, the closer I, I came to suicide. The walls were now shaking so hard it seemed as though, as though they were going to crumble, but the, still the faces smiled at me as I inched closer. Their eyes followed me. I was, I was now between the two bodies, a few feet away from the door. The, the dismembered hands clawed their way across the carpet towards me, all the while the faces continued to stare. Now terror washed over me as I... As I walked closer, I didn't want to hear them speak. I, I didn't want the voices to match those of my parents. They began to open their mouths and their, their hands were inches from my feet. In a dash of desperation, I lunged towards the door. I threw it open and I slammed it behind me. Room 8. I was done. After what I just experienced, I knew there, was, there wasn't anything else that this house could throw at me that I couldn't live through. There's nothing short of the fires of hell. But I wasn't ready for it, but unfortunately, I underestimated the abilities of Noah in the house. Unfortunately, things got more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in room 8. I still have trouble believing what I saw in room 8. Again, the room was a carbon copy of rooms 3 and 6, but sitting, sitting in that unusually empty chair was a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that that man sitting in that chair was me. Not someone who looked like me. He was David Williams. I walked closer. I, I had to get a better look, even though I was sure of it. He looked up at me, and I noticed tears in his eyes. Please. Please don't do it. Please. Please don't hurt me. What? I asked. Who are you? I'm, I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are. He was sobbing now. You're going to hurt me. And I don't want you to. He sat in the chair with his legs up and began rocking back and forth. It was, it was actually pretty pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was not only a few feet from my doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet, standing there talking to myself. I, I wasn't scared, but I would be soon. Why are you? You're going to hurt me. You're gonna hurt me if you if you want to leave. You're gonna hurt me. Why are you saying this? Okay, just calm down, all right? Look, let's try and figure this. And then I saw it. The David sitting down was wearing the same clothes as me, except for except for a small red patch on his shirt, embroidered with the number nine. You're gonna hurt me! You're gonna hurt me! You're gonna hurt me! Please! Please! You're, please don't! You're gonna hurt me! My eyes didn't leave that small number on his chest. I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors were plain and simple, but after a while they got a, a little more ambiguous. Seven was scratched out of the wall, but by my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents, but nine... This number was on a person, a living person, and worse still, it was on a person that looked exactly... Like me. David, I had to ask. Yeah. yeah you, you're gonna hurt me. You're gonna hurt me. He continued to sob and rock. He answered to David. He was me, right down to the voice, but that nine. I paced around for a few minutes. While he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door, and similarly to room six, the door I came through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time, and I studied the walls and floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath to see if anything was below, and unfortunately, unfortunately there was. Below the chair was a knife, and attached was a tag that read, To David, from Management. The feeling in my stomach as I read that tag was... Something sinister. I wanted to throw up, and the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under that chair. The other David was still sobbing uncontrollably. My mind was spinning into an attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here? How did they get my name? Not to mention the fact that I, w I knelt on the cold wood floor, and I also sat in that chair, sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. 
the house and the management had been playing with me the whole time. My thoughts, for some reason, turned to Peter and whether or not he had got this far. If he did, if he had, had met a Peter Terry sobbing in this very chair, rocking back and forth. I shook those thoughts out of my head. They, they didn't... They didn't matter. I, I took the knife from under the chair and I, the, immediately the other David went quiet. David, he said in my voice, what do you think you're going to do? I lifted myself from the ground, clenching the knife in my hand. I'm going to get out of here. David was still sitting in the chair, though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly he got up from the chair and he stood facing me. It was uncanny. His height, even the way that he stood, matched mine. I, I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand. I gripped it tighter. I don't know what I was planning to do with it, but I had a feeling I was going to need it. Now, his voice was slightly deeper than my own. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond. I just lunged and I tackled him to the ground. I had, I had mounted him and looked down, the knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror and then, and then the hum returned, low and distant, though I, I still felt it deep in my body. David looked up at me and I looked down at myself and the hum was getting louder and I felt something inside of me snap and with one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on his chest and I ripped down. Blackness fell onto the room and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had experienced up to that point. Room 4 was dark, but it didn't come close to what was completely engulfing me. I wasn't even sure if I was falling. After a while, I felt weightless, covered in dark. Then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed, suicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind. I knew it wasn't real, but I'd seen it, and the mind, the mind has trouble differentiating between what is real and what isn't. The sadness only deepened. I was, I was in room nine for what felt like days. The final room. And that's exactly what it was, the end. No one house had an end and I had reached it. At that moment, I gave up. I knew I would be in that in-between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I had lost all senses. I couldn't feel myself. I couldn't hear anything. Sight was completely useless here. I, I searched for a taste in my mouth and I found nothing. I felt disembodied, completely lost. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room 9 was hell. And then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. I felt, I felt ground come up below me and I was standing. And after a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked towards the light. And as I approached the light, it took... It took form. It was a vertical slit down the side of an unmarked door. I slowly walked through the door and I found myself back where I started. The lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I left it. Still empty, still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything, after everything that had happened that night, I, I was still wary of where I was. After a few moments of normalcy, I looked around the place, trying to find anything different. And on the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered up the courage to open the envelope, and inside was a letter. Again, handwritten. David Williams. Congratulations. You've made it to the end of No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of great achievement. Yours forever. Management. With the letter were five one hundred dollar bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I, I laughed for what seemed like hours. <laughs> I laughed as I walked out to my car and I laughed as I drove home and I laughed as I pulled into the driveway and I laughed as I opened my front door to my house and I laughed as I saw the small ten etched into the wood. Okay, so here's my story. B-16. Have family down in Alabama. Family own a large amount of land in Huntsville. Uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers that they put out in the woods for hunting or camping. Down south, cousins suggest we go on a trip. I know I'm a kid from the city, from Chicago, but they teased the hell out of me for it. 
collect food, kill a pig, some chickens, bring necessities to camp out for a few days. They go to the camp, it's obvious something is weird. There is this weird electric smell, like right before a storm, ozone. We think nothing of it and unpack, go down a little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, some older white guy and a white teenager come out of the bushes. He has a shotgun in the crook of his arm, says hello, asks us what we're doing this far back in the woods. Tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and says we're camping out. He tells us we need to be real careful out here and stick together, and there's a big animal in the woods. His son, who's my age, asks if he can stay and hang out with us. Say okay. Okay, I'm going to stop with the green text thing because the story's fairly long and the format's harder to write in. So, we end up playing football, digging around with me, and there's uh, this one white kid named Tanner. It's five of my cousins and four of their friends. In total, there are five girls, six boys. We are all around 15 or 16. We end up just dicking the whole day away. So, we head back to the camp, pulling out some stuff for a campfire, even though the trailers both have kitchenettes. Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He want to run home and ask his dad if he can come out and camp with us. My cousin Rooster says that he's going to go with them since it's going to get dark soon. One of the girls also wants to tag along. It's around 7 o'clock. And it's starting to get pretty dark. And it's starting to get pretty dark. Now they have flashlights to take the trail down Tan's property. The rest of us chill. We have smokes, drinks, kiss on the girls. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's a smell of ozone again. They could smell it over the smell of the fire that we had started. It's real nasty. It's coppery smell. It's like, like right after you have a nosebleed. And it stops. It wasn't exactly like dried blood, but it was like that nasty metallic, that back of your throat smell. But immediately think that it's some kind of electrical malfunction and someone left a hot plate on or something. So we search. Nothing's on. We can all smell it. All of a sudden, we hear people booking it down the path towards us, and Rooster, Tan, and the girl all come running out into the clearing out of breath. They don't even break stride. They all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. And we all get the hell out of there and into the trailers. They all end up calming down. Even Rooster's crying his eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is guttering lower and lower. So my other cousins say, screw it. And they're about to go outside and get the generator out of the shed between the trailers. Tanner goes, no, lock the front door, ain't nobody else going outside. He's been crying too. His eyes are bloodshot and puffy, his pants are all dirty. So he goes to tell us that they went up to the house. His father said sure, he could go out camping, but to make sure they were careful on the way back, then maybe they should take one of the hunting rifles just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in the yard a few days ago. One of their pigs had come up ripped up and half-eaten. They assumed it was just some big cat or coyote, even though they don't usually mess with living animals. He had gone upstairs, packed his stuff, told his dad that they would be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people, so they start walking back towards where we are camping at. So Rooster finally stops crying and shaking. Girl already had, but she was just like staring out the window with this dumb look on her face. He says they got halfway into the woods towards the camp when they started to hear something in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time. So they weren't sure at first what the hell it was. Girl says that she heard something in the bushes right off the trail. They all beam their flashlights over there and there's something. Someone. Standing back in the woods in a little hollow. So Rooster said they shouted at him. Told him that, that, that he was scaring the hell out of them. And what a dick he was. He says that's when he realized that the guy was facing away from them. They kept walking. They start smelling that nasty, coppery, ozone smell. They say that they look off into the forest on the opposite side, and it's a dude standing in the forest, backwards, slightly closer to the path. So now, now they start power walking, and Tan keeps going. He said, I should have taken the rifle, right? So as they, they're telling the story, the smell is still super strong, even inside the cabin. Well, they say that after they started walking faster, a kind of low gibbering had started coming from both sides of the wood. And as they started booking it back toward the trailer, the girl said she had flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of him. And she'd seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just gets louder and louder. And when they could see the light from our campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them and onto the track. And they had just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer. So, we're out in the woods. 
We're assuming at this point it's some... Some rednecks or something trying to mess with us. And all of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that, that was telling him about the goat man or something, right? And we'd, we probably told him to shut the hell up because we didn't need to hear any spooky talk right now. But he just keeps going on and on about how it's the goat man and how we're in his woods and blah, blah, blah. And now, now at the time, I had never heard of this goat man or any of that. But then a couple of years ago, a year before I graduated from college, I had a, a met him for a roommate and I ended up asking him about it. And to sum it up, it's basically like a man with a head of a goat and he can shapeshift and he gets among groups of people to terrorize them. It's also supposed to be like, kind of like the Wendigo and it's bad mojo to even talk about it. Even worse if you see it. But keep in mind, I don't know this back then when I was 16. So my cousin's going, goat man's going to get in. He's going to, he's going to get us. The girls are all terrified. My cousins and I, we're all, we're all just trying to figure out if it's just some hillbillies or if it's some animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Like usually smells fade away or they lessen. It was just literally, it was there one second, then not the next. So it was after an hour, making it around nine or 10. We've stopped, you know, freaking out enough to go back outside and stoke the fires again. We figured it's just some asshole trying to mess with us, so we don't go back home because we think if we do, they'll chase us through the woods or something crazy, so nothing else weird happens that night. We stay another night, and for the main part of the night, nothing happens. So at about one in the morning, we're outside, we're getting drunk, we're telling ghost stories. And if someone is finishing some too spooky story, I don't remember what about, the smell comes back. And it is so strong. It was one of the one of the girls literally starts vomiting. I stand up. And you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I say we we should get inside. This isn't right. We should just we should have just left, right? So we all go back inside. We're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on about how it's the goat man. My cousin Rooster tries to tell him to shut up. And all the while, I'm just feeling like something is wrong, and I can't figure out what the hell it is. So we end up sitting in there for a while. The smell is just as strong. We're terrified. We're huddled in this camper. We end up cooking brats for everybody because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs of like four brats, right? So we have a total of three packs. I grill them up on the stove. I give, them, I give everybody a hot dog. I get mine. After a while, one of my cousins gets up, goes over to the pot to get another one. Starts grumbling about how I got two brats, everybody else got one. I look at him like he's stupid. I tell him that everybody got one because there were only 12 brats. If he wanted more, he should have opened up a new pack and cooked some more. And that's when one of the girls that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming like, Oh Jesus, oh Lord, get it out. She's crying and she's shivering. And then it dawns on the cousin standing, What the hell is wrong? Me and him both glance around the room and then I feel my heart sink. I, I run the hell out of the cabin. The girl runs out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everyone books it out of the cabin. One of my cousin's friends asks us what the hell was wrong. I start counting us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And there is only 11 of us now. I'm not crazy, my cousin verified. There have been 12 people in the cabin, but being being that everybody didn't really know each other that well, nobody had really noticed the whole, the whole time that there was an extra person. And then I realized earlier that I kind of noticed something was off. You know how when you're just, you're just dicking around and you're having a good time and you don't sweat the small stuff and you don't actually keep track of certain stuff? Well, I'm dead sure that someone else had been in that trailer with us and that they had been there with us for at least a day eating with us. What makes it worse is I, I could figure out which one, because I didn't I didn't know anyone ever actually interacted with the other person, the, the goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus, and we're all sitting outside. And eventually, we get we get these big sticks. We go back in the cabin. There's no one there. We count again: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and there are eleven people. We go back into the trailer. We lock the door. We explain what the hell happened. The girl says. She realized it too, and that's when he was about to say something. The person sitting next to her and he had grabbed her leg hard. He leaned over toward her and said something she couldn't understand. So we pretty much just scared to hell and back. We just huddled together. I fall asleep. 
When I wake up, the sun is just coming up and half of the people are asleep and the other half are packing their stuff up. We all want to walk back home. But like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up. And some people think that we're just messing around, still want to stay at the trailers. I want to get the hell out of the woods. Girl's name. Um, the girl's name was Kira, the one that the goat man had touched. And anyway, I asked her if she really thinks it was something bad. She says she just wants to go home. She doesn't want to be in the woods alone for another night. So we decide to split up. Okay, the four that want to go can go. But I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin. It's my uncle's and I have to lock up. Now, I'm like stupid mad at this point because I feel like people aren't taking this seriously. And I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. So I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people, now four girls, four guys, to get the hell out of Dodge. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle, says that he'll be back. So there's just seven of us left by 4 p.m. Around five. He hasn't made it back yet. We're getting extremely antsy. The only reason I stopped begging them to go back was because he went to get a gun. It's about 5.30. When the one cousin that did stay says that the girl Kira's outside, we all look outside, and sure enough, she's standing by the fire pit with her back to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, if she was so scared, why the hell would she come back? Then I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind, the whole time, the copper smell is gone. Now I realize I can smell just a twinge of it. And I say this to the rest of them and everybody. These, these are the people that wanted to stay in the woods after we had the goddamn goat man in our midst. And they're laughing at me and asking if I set this whole thing up to scare them. I'm looking at them. I am not messing with you at all right now. I ask them, why the hell would I play like that? So one of the girls goes outside to get Kira. She gets about halfway to her and stops cold. Kira is heaving. I, I, I don't know how to how to describe it. Sort of like a, sort of like if if someone with their back turned was like laughing without actually making any sound. It was, it was this fact that made me realize that there was there was not a sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like in late September, so it was fairly hot at the time, but it was super chilly some days too, and you could usually hear these big geese honking or, or some kind of bird or squirrel chit-chatting. So I step out the door and I tell her to come back into the trailer right now. She backs up into the trailer. We lock the door. Pull down all the shades except one and put a guy there in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes. Guy turns to say that she's still there, and then there's this huge bang on the door. We all jump up. We scramble around the living room in the trailer. The banging is super, super loud. So we, now my cousin is holding one of the girls and the, the other two are kind of giggling with nervous laughter. And me, the only, the only two guys, we're, we're losing our minds. Then we hear Tanner and he's screaming, let me in, stop playing. So go over to the door, we open it and he stumbles in with a rifle. And there's nobody else outside. Evidently he walked up to the campsite. Nothing weird happened in the forest. But he hadn't seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kira standing there. When he got to the edge of the clearing, she had turned toward him with with the slack-jawed look. It stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it wasn't until he had almost been halfway to the trailer that he realized that she was getting closer to him. She had started, started off by the fire, and without him even seeing her move, she had been, been turning and inching closer. He said that he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin, thinking that it would open. And when he got to the door, it was locked. And he turned, and it was about half the distance to the door. And he looked around the room, and then, then he got super pale. He pulled me to the side. He whispers in my ear, you know, there's only seven of us in here, right? And I, I get that feeling when your stomach just drops out of you. It had been back inside the trailer while we were sorting out who was going where. And then, and then we, when we all went outside to talk to, earlier in the day, it, it just slipped back in. We looked out the window. There was nobody out there. So we recount everybody, and basically I go over, and I ask everyone how many people we had earlier. Everyone says eight. I said, well, how many are with us now? They all do the count. They realize, they realize there's only now seven people in the cabin. 
so Tanner brought back a couple boxes of ammo and his rifle. He told his dad that there was some kind of animal in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was the goat man. So he says that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will just drive us home. So now I'm really terrified. But I at least feel better because we can we can be American. We just shoot the hell out of whatever it is if it comes back, right? And my cousin gets in this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks that I'm trying to be funny and I'm trying to prank them. And she's getting really scared. I'm not funny. And he keeps telling her, I'm not that kind of person. She says, well, how do we know that girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? Or, or if it's really the goat man, how do we know that this is the real Tanner and not the goat man that didn't just kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we get this huge argument about this. Or me and Tan were like, we could seriously be in danger because at the very least someone has been sneaking themselves into our trailer without us knowing and mingling with us. And at worst, something bad is in the forest and it's messing with us. So one of the girls is crying and she's saying she wants to go home right now. And we're telling her that we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down. It's getting a little cloudy out. We eat something, turn on the radio for a while, but we... We can't really get a station out here with anything decent. We turn it off at about the time that Tanner's cousin shows up. He's like 19, I think. And so at this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon. And he has one of those heavy-duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer. He whispers to Tan, asking if he's sure that he's his cousin. He says, yes. The guy looks behind him, all around the camp. He walks in. Kind of glances at all of us. He looks a little confused. He's like, where's your other little buddy at? Figured that she would have met up with you at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we had been cooking blood in the cabin because it smelled like blood and hot pans all the way up the trail. We're all just like, nope. But we ask him what he's talking about with a girl he saw. He had come down the same trail that Tan had been using and he had come up on one of you guys' buddies standing in the middle of the trail, looking at him, slack-jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions. All she did was look at him. Then she smiled at him. He said he just kept walking. But she couldn't seem to keep up with him, and he just kept lagging a little behind. He said that he, he asked her if she was hurt or something and if she needed any help, but she had continued to stare. Eventually, he'd been walking and turned around a bend in the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she was okay, the trail was empty. He assumed she had taken some shortcut through the woods to our trailer. We told him the whole story of what had been going on. I half expected him to say that we were full of it, but he just, he just listened. He sat down on the couches in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl. He says, when she had kept trying to lag behind, it had kind of weirded him out. He tried to keep her in front of him. No matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little behind. And then he smelled that nasty smell and it got stronger as he got to the camp. And eventually, got real strong. She had said something real low that he didn't catch. And when he had turned around, she had been right there, right up on him. He stepped back from her. It was at that point when he asked if she was okay. And if she wasn't, he could carry her back the rest of the way. And she was just kept staring. He said he reached out for her as to, like, to grab her on the shoulder, but he must have misjudged the distance because she was off to the side of where he put his hand. Like She had moved while he was looking dead at her. So at this point, we, we know it's real. right? Almost Tan is playing a joke, which we could tell he's not because he's almost like peeing his pants right here. So they, they, they load up the rifles. We eat some more. We just kind of sit around till about 11. You know, to this day... Every time I think about this, I really pray to God that it's some huge prank that my cousins played on me. It just never revealed, so it's, you know I would I would just be terrified for the rest of my life. At around eleven, the stink of copper turns into an an actual like nasty, gross, blood-like smell, like a cooking blood and singed hair. Tan and his cousin Reese they get up instantly and they grab the rifles. It's like half knocking half clawing at the door oh, i'm not kidding you there there's this voice and it sounds like when you 
when you see those YouTube cat and dog videos, you know, when the owners teach them how to talk, it sounds like it's it sounds like this weird, halting, weirdly toned voice. Let me in. Stop playing. I swear to God. I tied my stomach in the knots. One of the girls, one of the girls just starts crying, calling on Jesus. It was so obviously not a person talking. It didn't have the right cadence. It's some something that I never realized until that moment, but all people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm to talking. And this didn't have any kind of cadence or rhythm. One of those YouTube cats, uh, it sounded like it was outside the door. So now I'm, I'm on like full on terror mode. We keep yelling outside, who is it? Stop messing around, man. It just keeps saying in or let me in for almost 15 minutes. So the smell goes away after a while. And for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around the woods. And every couple of minutes, it will come back to the door and say something. Finally, when the smell fades, it's around like 2 in the morning right now. And Reese says, man, forget this. And he opens up the door. He walks outside with his rifle. And he fires a shot in the air. And he says something effective like, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away. And he fires two more times. And then from the woods, right up against the river, across the trailer, it sounds like something is slowly gibbering and hooting. And then it, it starts screaming. And it sounds like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together. Like, like seriously, I've never heard anything like that. And you can, you can hear the, the brush over that way start to shake. And Reese fires over to the tree line and then, then starts backing into the house. We lock the door. We can hear this, this thing just keening and screaming. And Reese says something, something had come out of the bushes, like super low to the ground and crawl falling toward the cabin and he had shot at it he, he, sh he definitely shot at it pretty much that that was that was how the rest of the night went it was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours and we could hear it we could hear it moving into the tree line but it never came back to the cabin until everyone had fallen asleep tan had been sitting in a chair watching the door with his rifle and nobody else nobody else heard or saw this he told me he told me to this he told me two days later after the whole situation was over he said that he said that he'd, he'd been nodding off after the screaming and the noises had finally stopped. Right, and he, he, he'd been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and then lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us. He'd, he'd just nodded off. Then he said he kind of, kind of realized something was wrong and while pretending to be sleeping, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. They basically didn't want to try to shoot at the thing. You know, while it's in the cabin, have it kill us all then and there. Have Reese wake up, start shooting, and we kill ourselves. So we just stayed awake all night, pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes, sometimes it would it would kind of stand up and do this weird jittery thing or a heave like it was laughing. Then I'd just lay back down. And the story closes pretty weak because from my perspective, nothing happened. We woke up. All I I noticed was that Tan was a little jittery and. And he was avoiding looking at us, but we ate some breakfast, we packed up, we started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin and said that he locked up, bringing my uncle's keys to just start walking, he'd catch up, which I didn't really want to do. We got up the path, and when he came running up, basically, we just, we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. And there's a window in the bathroom. The tan had gone back to lock up and, and looked in there. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was, window was wide open when he went in there. Guessing it had been doing that all along, waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up, get in among us, walked with us all the way back to his house. And then he said, it lagged to the back of the group, looked him dead in the eyes, and walked back into the woods. Some people say he's a myth, an urban legend, a made-up story meant to scare people. However, I've seen him. I've seen what he's capable of. I've seen how frightening he really is. And I never want to see him again. I was around the age of 11. I lived in the country with my mom, dad, and eight-year-old sister. The entire town was surrounded by forests, and not very many people lived in it. It was a simple town. No big business chains or anything like that. All the shops were family-owned. In fact, 
Our family owned a small bakery that was actually the downstairs level of our home. My sister Abigail and I would always go to that tiny park by the edge of the woods to play with the other children, the ones that lived in that town. There weren't very many, so we all knew each other. Sometimes my sister would go to the park by herself while I did my homework. And one day, she came into my room while I was working on some math problems. Hey, she said to me excitedly. I met someone new at the park. You should come meet him. I turned to her with a smile. I can't, Abby, I said. Mom says I can't go out and play until my homework's finished and my room's clean. But he's not going to be there all day, said Abby. He's probably already gone. I'm sure he'll come and play another day, I said, turning back to my work. I'll meet him next time. I had quite a bit of homework for the next couple of days. Abby would always try to get me to play in the park with her and her friend, who she didn't seem to know the name of. But I was too busy. Finally, it was Saturday, and I didn't have anything to do. We went to the park together, and we played on the seesaw. Where's your new friend? I asked her. I guess he's not here yet, she replied. I was beginning to wonder if his friend was imaginary. After about 15 minutes, a younger kid came up to us and tugged on Abby's sleeve. Hey, Abby, he said. Tall stranger's back. Let's go play with him. Abby hopped off the seesaw and urged me to follow. I felt uneasy at hearing the boy call his friend Tall Stranger. All the same, my curiosity was too great, and I followed. All the children headed into the forest, gathered around a dark tree. I stood by my sister and gasped, seeing that it wasn't a tree at all, but an unnaturally tall man. He had to be eight or nine feet tall. He was so thin. I thought the wind was going to blow him away. He was wearing a black business suit. His arms were too long to be proportional. I squinted, trying to see his chalk-white face, but for some reason, I couldn't make it out. It was as if there was no face at all. Something about the man unnerved me. Part of me was enticed to come closer, but the other part of me was screaming, telling me to run away. There was a faint ringing in my ears. The children circled around him, for whatever reason. They were more drawn to him than I was. I wondered if it had anything to do with the fact that I was older than all of them a few years. They reached up to him, touching his thin, bony white hands. Abby was trying to push through the other kids so that she could touch the man as well. I looked at her face. Her eyes seemed almost hypnotized, as if the man's presence was luring her into some kind of trap. I looked back up to the man and gasped, seeing how multiple tentacle-like arms were coming from him, reaching slowly to the children. They cooed softly, reaching their hands up excitedly. The ringing in my ears was now painfully loud. I screamed and covered them, and I felt dazed. My mind was foggy, and my vision was blurring. Abby was still trying to get closer to the man, but without thinking, I grabbed her hand and ran as quickly out of the woods as I could. I didn't even look back. Once back in the park, Abby yanked her arm away from me, practically sobbing. Why did you do that? She yelled. I wanted to play with a tall stranger. Abby, I said, panting. That thing, it is bad. I don't even know what it is. Please, don't ever go near it again. You can't make me, Abby screamed at me. I'll tell Mom not to let you go, I said. I'll say there's a, there's a creepy man always hanging around the park. She won't let us go anymore. Why don't you want to come here anymore, said Abby. I don't want you to be around that thing, I replied. And I took her hand. And I led her home. I had told Mom about the stranger in the park leaving out the details of how unnatural he was. But she didn't seem to think anything of it. She said it was probably just someone's father that we didn't know him or something. I didn't want to argue. I just, I just had to make sure Abby didn't go to the park myself. Mom soon changed her mind, however. The next day on the news, there was a report of three missing children. They were siblings. And Abby and I had just seen them in the park the day before, gazing up at that creature in the forest. According to the news story, they had gone to the park, and they had never returned home. Their parents were distraught. There was no sign of struggle, though. They seemed to have simply vanished. After seeing the story, Mom seemed to have decided the stranger I told her about was probably not to be trusted, and she had forbade us from going to the park without an adult. 
disappearances didn't stop other kids from going. For each day, more children were disappearing. Again, there was no evidence as to where they could have gone. I wondered why parents kept letting their kids go, but then I thought, what if they were going without their parents knowing? I had to be careful. I needed to keep a close eye on Abby. A week went by, and Abby and I were the only children left in the whole town. The police were searching everywhere for all of the missing kids, but they hadn't come even close to solving the case. It all felt so unrealistic. Like a dream. How could dozens of kids go missing without a trace? Strange things started to happen to Abby as the next week rolled on. She started getting out of bed in the middle of the night, standing next to it, staring blankly at the wall, not moving for hours, and then she'd lay and sleep once more. When I caught her doing this, I told her the next morning. She said she couldn't remember. Abby had also stopped eating. Mom was getting worried and urged her to eat, but she always said that she wasn't hungry. She was drawing strange pictures obsessively, as if she'd been controlled by something unseen. The pictures all had a very messy circle with a scribbled X drawn over it, saying things like, seize me, run, other disturbing phrases and words. Sometimes I'd watch her draw these pictures, her eyes glassy, her hand moving abnormally fast across the page. Finally, one night, I heard her get out of bed. I stood up and I went to the hall, and I saw her leaving her room. This was a first. All the other times, she just stood like a statue next to her bed. I tried calling to her, but she didn't respond. I followed her, and she left the house and out into the night. It was cold, slightly windy, and neither of us had shoes on. I walked closely behind her, but it seemed that she was unaware that I was even there. I even tapped her on the shoulder, but she completely ignored me. And then... Then I saw that we were heading into the park. Abby, I whispered urgently. We shouldn't be here. Let's go home. She didn't answer. I grabbed her arm and I pulled her back. But for some odd reason, she seemed stronger than me. She continued to walk through the park and into the forest. I didn't want to go in there, but I wasn't going to leave Abby alone. Our surroundings got darker as we headed deeper into the woods. I followed Abby so much further into the trees than before when we had seen that tall creature. And again, I tried to tell her to come home with me, but she stayed silent. There was a very faint ringing in my ears again. Further and further we walked until finally we came to an area where the trees were less dense and was lit by moonlight. Abby stopped walking. I stood next to her. I hugged her arm and urged her to turn around. The ringing in my ears started growing louder and my head began to hurt. I closed my eyes, holding my head in pain as the high-pitched whine became too loud to withstand. Suddenly... It stopped. I opened my eyes, looking up slowly. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. He was standing right in front of me, towering above me like some kind of living tree. I looked at Abby and I saw her staring up at him, her eyes blank as if she was in a trance. Abby! I gasped, but my voice was hoarse. Please, let's go! Run! Still, she didn't move. I grabbed her shoulders and shook her. Abby! She slowly tilted her head to the side, staring at me. It was eerie, the look she was giving me. Still, she remained silent. Just then, I saw a thin tentacle-like hand wrap around Abby's throat. She was ripped out of my grasp. I screamed, watching as she was lifted into the air. I wanted to run, but my legs wouldn't move, and I couldn't, I couldn't look away. Abby was struggling, choking from the man's grasp. He seemed to be staring at her with his non-existent face. A, a fierce wind blew through the trees for a mere second. And then everything was still and silent. Almost too silent. Abby was limp, her head hanging down and I couldn't see her face. The man slowly sat down on the fourth floor and she stood next to him, seeming to be unconscious. I wanted to approach her, but I was still glued to the spot. Nothing prepared me for what happened next. Abby slowly lifted her head and stared at me. I gasped, horrified at her face. Her skin was pallid, clammy looking. Her eyes were sunken in, blank, sleepless shadows underneath her eyelids. And then, then she began to cry blood. She wasn't sobbing or even moving in any way. She just stood there, unblinking, blood running from her eyes and down her cheeks. 
I felt like I was going to be sick. And I was aware of this. Many glowing eyes watching us. I saw the shadows of children in the distance. They disappeared as soon as I had noticed them. I, I looked back to Abby and saw her body fading into the darkness, becoming nothing but a silhouette of her former self, and then... And then she was gone. I felt tears running down my face, but I couldn't move a muscle or make a sound. I stared up at the tall, no-faced man, and he began to walk away, finally disappearing into the trees. I stood there for maybe an hour before I was able to move. I fell to my knees and I sobbed and I continued to look around to see if Abby would come back. I called out for her, but I knew she was gone. I lay on the wet, leafy ground, shivering, crying. Hours later, a group of policemen had found me in the forest. It seemed Mom had called the police once she had noticed Abby and I weren't in our beds. The men had to lift me off the ground and carry me home, but when we got to my house, they questioned me about my sister where she had gone. Man, I said softly, a tall, slender man in a, in a black suit. It took her and the other children away. Can you describe him? said one of the policemen. He was as tall as a tree. Skinnier than me, I explained, shaking from the memory of the creature. His skin was white, his arms were too long. He had no face. At one point, he had more than two arms, but they looked like... They looked like tentacles. The policemen looked at each other, and I wasn't sure if they believed me or not. Shortly after the incident, Mom was packing up the house. The police were still searching for Abby and the other missing children, but they found nothing. We ended up moving very far away from that town and into the city. She hoped it would be safer. I still don't know if anyone believed me about the Slender Man. Years had gone by, and I was in college. I moved away from my home, I got an apartment on my own, I never told her, but I continued to see the Slender Man periodically. I saw him outside in the streets at night. I even saw him outside my house a few times. Sometimes I had the strangest feeling that he was in my room when I was asleep, watching me. I knew I couldn't run from it, but I didn't want Mom around. I didn't know what he wanted, all I knew was that I... I didn't want him around anymore. And finally, my sightings of him decreased in number. And I can't explain why or how, but I, I was relieved. However, it didn't chase away the nightmares I had every night. Always the same. My sister's bloody face fading into darkness. You know, some say he's a myth, urban legend, a meme. This story. Some say he eats the children he abducts. Others say he simply kills him. Only I know the truth. Many people claim to have seen him. I know they haven't. Slenderman doesn't eat children. From what I saw, I can't explain what he does with them. It almost seems like he, he steals their souls. Steals them away in some other dimension. I'm, and I witnessed it. People ask me if I've heard of the Slenderman. And you know what I say? No. If you're one of the people who are inherently drawn to horror, then you're in real danger. I don't know what it is exactly, I don't pretend to know everything that's going on, and in fact I myself used to be drawn to more realistic, non-supernatural creepypastas, but about a year ago I was up at 3 in the morning, you know, but part of the night where you're so deep into it that it feels like it never ends. Anyway, I was up clicking around, looking for some good stories I hadn't run into before, really getting myself freaked out, you know, the feeling. You like the feeling. That's the problem. Anyway, well, I'm reading and I hear a pattering sound come from the kitchen. I have a cat, so I just assumed that it was her. But then, I glance at my bed and my cat's there. And I've been freaking myself out for a while here, so I was naturally trembling with fear as I opened my bedroom door. I, I lived alone a single bedroom apartment with just a bedroom, a kitchen, living room, and a bathroom. My bedroom door opens up to the kitchen. It was pitch black, moonlight gleaming off the linoleum. I strained my ears and I listened. I heard nothing. I abominated myself for being such a coward. It was just random house noises, right? Just a mouse in the walls. I was about to turn around and head back to my room when I heard it again. And I saw something scatter across the linoleum in the kitchen, heading for the bathroom. 
It was small, but it was definitely not a rat. The limbs were way, way too long, the torso far too high off the ground, and the way it moved, it, well, it, it moved quickly, but so awkwardly. In any other circumstance, I might have laughed at it. As it was, I was scared, motionless. So, you know, I basically freeze for like ten minutes. The size of the thing that convinced me to move. No matter how weird or messed up it was, it was so much smaller than me, it couldn't have been that dangerous, right? So, I pop open the bathroom door. Before I turn on the light, I do a quick scan. Nothing. I flick the switch, I look around, still nothing. I look on the ceiling, even. Till the shower curtain open. Nothing. What could it have been? My mind starts inventing explanations. Definitely had four limbs. Maybe it was a big-ass spider and lost four of its legs somehow. That could explain the awkward movement. Which was good enough for me. I was about to go back to bed when I thought, on a whim, to use the broom and poke behind the toilet. Between the wall and the base of the seat. When I did, I hit something solid and it scurried out. It looked like a, like a tiny human. It was pale white, pale as a maggot. Had dirty gray streaks running along its skin, moved on all fours with long, thin fingers that grasped the ground. Its skull was completely bald; it had no eyes. The skin looked like it, like it had been torn away from the lower half of its face, leaving the exposed teeth and gums. It looked up at me, well, pointed its face in my general direction anyway, and then it scurried, quick as hell, up the side of the bath and down into the drain. Moved at quick bursts like a spider, and it climbed straight up smooth surfaces like one too. After it disappeared down the drain, I just, I just stood there. It was frozen. Broom handle still in my hand for a good five minutes. I was terrified. I, I slowly backed out of the bathroom. I closed the door, and then I stuffed a blanket in the crack between the floor and the door, fearing that it might come out. Then I sat in my bed and I wondered what I could do. It wasn't like I could call the police or even tell my friends. It's not like, not like they'd believe me. So what do I do? I, I make a thread here. It's quite a while ago, almost a year. You might even remember it. Was there anything special? It didn't even get that many responses before falling off the board. A few people, I guess, thought that it was just a joke, which really, I would have thought the same thing. My thread, in retrospect, sounded exactly like the type of thread that I hate. It's people from all over giving me those responses. Was, I've seen them too, man. Email me along with an email address that I'm not going to give out. So I email this kid, right? Right away he responds and we start up a conversation in IRC. He introduces himself as John and basically tells me a very similar story. One night a few months ago, he's reading stories, he heard a noise, he got up, he saw the small pale man. And he's a bit bigger, so it was the size of a cat. He also told me one other thing, that I'd be seeing more of them, he said that. Ever since he saw the first one, he's been seeing more and more of them out everywhere, even on the street during the day. They were everywhere, he said. He said, and once you noticed the first one, it got a lot easier to see all the others. He had no idea what they were. He hadn't figured out their behavior yet. He said that usually when he saw them or heard them in his own house, he was reading creepypasta stories. So they usually freaked him out, something awful. But then he said again, he'd never actually seen them do anything terrible, just scurry out of sight. But he said some got pretty big. Not all of them looked exactly the same. I still didn't sleep that night. Over the next week, and those that followed, I found that I did get used to them. I did see more of them. I'd glimpse them out of the corner of my eye. I'd see the, the retreating rear end of one crawling into a gutter pipe. I'd see their, their tiny faces staring at the street from the sewers. Some, it seemed, weren't even trying to hide. I, look, I live in Providence, Rhode Island, which is a small city. On my way to work one day, I take the bus. I was looking out the window and I saw a pretty large one, as large as a medium-sized dog trotting around the sidewalk. People were just walking by it. I think a lot of people saw it as a dog. One man stopped, scratched his head. I'd always email John to tell him about all the appearances I saw. He even tried to catch some on camera, but they always heard the mechanical whirring. They'd dart away from my camera before I could take a picture. I told myself that I'd have to take a picture of one of the bigger, slower ones. Either way, as the weeks wore on, I became more and more used to them. Sure, they were creepy as hell. I could never sit down on the toilet and enjoy a long crap anymore because I was paranoid that they'd climb up out of the bowl and, like, bite me on the ass, but they weren't really doing anything harmful. They unnerved the hell out of me. And so did big spiders. You could live with them. John called them the Gristers because he said 
they reminded him of the Grifter meme, for some reason. I'm sure that he meant the Grifter meme, but the name Grifter stuck. I continued my exchanges with John. I noticed that he was becoming more and more tense. It was hard to tell over the text, but really, that was the only way to put it. I just figured that once the novelty of a shared experience had worn off, we didn't really have much to talk about. John wasn't really my type. He was a steroid-pumping bodybuilder in southern Florida who lived with his mom. But we started discussing Grister behavior, and he said that his were starting to act a bit more differently than the ones I saw. He'd wake up at night, and they'd be perched at the end of his bed, staring at him with their eyeless faces. They wouldn't scurry away anymore. He said that he woke up one time because one of them had actually started touching his face. It, that seemed unnerving. The whole time, I'd been putting out inquiries on the internet to see if anyone else had experienced the phenomena. I couldn't, I couldn't be the only one, but no one came forward. I asked most of my threads about the subject got saged, so eventually I stopped asking. But I had an inquisitive mind. I wanted to know what these things did. What exactly they were. I wanted to capture one. I, I left out food and mouse traps, but none of the things ever went for it. My cat would notice them, though. She'd hiss at them, even chase them a couple of times. All those times I'd ever seen her do that, and assumed that she was just being a dumbass cat, she's getting nothing. One night I was walking home from work, and I work at this call center for a police charity. My house was about six miles away. I had to stay late, so there was no bus to come pick me up. And I didn't really have all that many friends, so I had to walk. Anyway, I was walking past some old abandoned brick houses. It was creepy stuff, I tell you. When I heard some weird low groan, that's when I happened to notice that there was a lot more gristers than usual. They were mostly ignoring me, but they they were scurrying in and around one particular brick house. The groaning sound seemed to be coming from the alley beside it, and now a lot of gristers was creepy, even without the low groaning noise. What made me decide to investigate, I don't know, but it made me morbid curiosity. I'm always looking for some creepy, gory stuff to post on the board. I thought that maybe the groaning was some kind of wounded animal or something, so I approached, noting that the windows were boarded up. The groaning... I should have known then that it was no animals. Low as creaking, gurgling sounds. It didn't sound like any animal that I knew. So he snuck down in the alley, and when I saw what was making the noise, I nearly lost myself. It was a fat, humongous grister, at least eight feet wide, completely unable to move, the rolls of fat hanging down over its legs. It had no neck, just 14 chins leading up to its macabre exposed jaw, drooling, Dirty drool ran down its chin to cover its obscenely huge belly. Small gristers crawled in and out of the rolls of its fat and rubbed itself with a pudgy claw, making that groaning, gurgling sound sound almost sexual. It was terrible. I know it doesn't sound like it, and I could think that a fat, cooing grister rubbing itself might sound pretty funny, actually, but in the in the presence of that thing, all I, I felt was a, a sick revulsion and disgust. But but I kept in mind one thing, that I had been looking for a picture of these things. So I, I busted out my camera phone and I snapped a picture. I wish I hadn't. I mean, if, if I hadn't, maybe I could have lasted a little bit longer. The minute I snapped the picture, the thing stopped groaning and swiveled its head towards me. And all the gristers did, in fact. They, they all started hissing and screaming at me. It's a horrible sound, like rusty nails on a chalkboard. I was freaking out. I, I, to put things mildly, I just lost my shit. I ran out of there as fast as I could, ran all the way home. Gristers didn't seem so harmless to me now. The noise that they made, it was straight out of hell. I didn't feel safe with the lights off anymore. I flipped all the lights on, scaring the hell out of my napping cat. I slammed the bedroom door shut, stuffed a blanket around the cracks again. Then I sat down on my bed and I looked at the picture I had taken. And there it was. There it was clear as day. That huge grister just looking at it made me feel sick. Because I was going to post it on X. I let it on my computer, I sent an image to John with the subject, will you look at this fat? And then I immediately came to X and began typing up my thread, explaining to myself, explaining the gristers, explaining the photograph. I was getting ready to post when John sent me a message. Yo, don't show this to anyone. I stopped. I replied to John, asked him what he was talking about. He told me, he said that he thought he figured out what was making the gristers around him more hostile. He said that he thought that when they figured out that you could see them, he started getting more aggressive. He showed me scratches that he had all down his arms from them clawing at him at night. He said that he'd seen a lot more of the bigger ones hanging around his house at night. They watched him through his windows. They knew. They knew he could see them, and they didn't like it. And now I was pretty sure they knew I could see them too. So, so what do I do? 
in the end, I, I didn't post the picture. I was too intimidated, but it probably saved a lot of you. I, I didn't want to trigger anyone else into being able to see these guys if it had dangerous consequences down the road. I didn't notice any behavior changes right away. For a while, in fact, for about two weeks, the Gristers acted like just the same way that they had been before. I was beginning to think that John's problem was his own thing, and that the Gristers didn't know or didn't care that I could see them. And then, then things start happening so fast. I wake up one night, and there's four of them just perched around my bed, staring at me. I freaked the hell out. I, sw I swept them away, and they hissed that terrible noise at me, and they ran away. I emailed this to John, who hadn't talked otherwise. He didn't respond. He didn't talk since I told him about the pictures, and even rarely before then. After two days, during which the Gristers began touching me in my sleep, I got an answer. John was dead. His brother had the password to his email and was letting all his internet acquaintances know he had committed suicide. He sliced open his wrists in the bathtub. John... John was... He didn't seem like the type to commit suicide to me. He, he had things with the Gristers really gotten that bad. They drove him to that. We didn't really know each other very well, but he hadn't mentioned anything to me. His brother said he hadn't left a note. I gave him my condolences. Now I had no one to talk to about this. I started, I started looking online for references or anything. All the while, the Gristers were getting more and more aggressive. I'd look over my shoulder and there'd be one or two on the windowsill just staring at me. One time I opened the door to my apartment, I live on the third floor, and there was one about the size of a large dog staggering around the bottom of the stairwell, pale face flashing in and out of the darkness, baring its teeth in a growl at me, pale limbs flashing as it bounded up the stairs, and I slammed the door shut. I didn't go to work that day. And I saw it on the news. That house, the one I'd seen, the, the one I'd seen with that fat-ass grister, I would have skipped right past the news story had I not seen the picture of the house. The article was titled, Eight found dead, three alive in dungeon raid. Apparently, some sick guy had been using the basement of one of those abandoned houses to keep women prisoner, kill them when he felt like it. It's a terrible story. One of the things, one of the survivors said something that really stuck with me. We were so terrified all the time, we never knew when he was going to come in and decide to kill one of us. We were just so terrified all the time. Terrified. All the time. And Grishas had been all over that place. And when I first saw one, I'd been, I'd been reading stories. I'd been pretty freaked out. Same for John. So were these things just drawn to fear? And then I read two of the survivors had been sent to, uh, to a mental hospital for hallucinations. I mean, did they, did they see the Gristers? I stopped sleeping. I didn't want to wake up to one of those things staring at me. I stopped eating, too. Whenever I wasn't at work, which was more and more often, as I called out many times when I saw gristers that were bigger than a cat sniffing around my building for me, I was locked in my room trying to hunt for information on the internet about these things. I couldn't find anyone who had actually seen them. The gristers were, they were getting more violent. They were starting to scratch me. They were trying to bite me in those few scant hours that I actually did not off. They'd always freak out and sweep them away, and they'd just hiss at me. After about a week of this, I came home from work to find my cat dead. I quit my job. I cried for days. Man, I don't, I don't have many friends. I, I really loved that cat. They're not stupid. They don't talk and act differently from us, but they do have intelligence. And I went out for food last week. It was the last time that I ever go out. I, I was sitting at the the downtown bus station, shivering, looking all around for gristers. When the bus approached, I got up to get on. Out of nowhere, a grister the size of a normal human just bent over, walking their weird loping gait, slammed into the back of the woman next to me and threw her out in front of the bus. She had no chance. I saw her slide under the wheels of the bus. I saw her blood and ruined organs squeeze out of her mouth like toothpaste. Everyone freaked out and panicked. As people rushed to her aid, and the grister turned toward me and he grinned. I dropped my groceries and I screamed, running back to my house, sobbing all the way. They're toying with me. That's when I finally realized why there wasn't anyone I could talk to about gristers. How many times when people commit suicide do you hear it reported that they were suffering from hallucinations? Or either reports of people who have been, who've been in terrible, frightening situations, like at dungeon or a war. Or how many of them suffer from hallucinations? Sure, a lot of them are actual hallucinations. Some of them? The gristers. And eventually they find out that you can see them, and then... Then they start messing with you, and I didn't think everyone who had, 
who they kill is driven. I don't think John was driven to suicide. I think it, it I think they're smart. I think they know how to make something look like. You hear about it sometimes. You're reading a report about how someone had killed themselves, but something just isn't quite right about it. Like a man who went out and bought a new car and then, then he cut his wrists in it. And X, I'm convinced that there's nothing special about John and me. I don't think there's anything special about anyone who sees these things. I think you're just more likely to see them when you're really scared, since that's what they're drawn to. I can hear him right now. It's about three in the morning. Sounds like a really big one outside of my apartment door. It sounds like it's trying to gnaw its way through the wood, and I'm so trying to take the easy way out. Okay, I'd rather have a nice sharp knife slice open my arm than have skin torn away by those teeth. So please, this is my warning to you. Stop it. Stop reading and stop listening. I know you love it. I know you love frightening yourself. You gotta stop. Every time you read it, every time you get that feeling of dread in your stomach, you're drawing the gristers to you. And if you don't stop, at least, please, never check out those sounds in the house when you do. What better way to overcome your fears than to chase them head on? That's been my motto throughout my whole life. When I was five, my father locked me inside a room full of spiders to show me that they were nothing to be afraid of. And it worked. After day three, I was no longer scared of the eight-legged creatures that used to haunt my dreams. That's why I've decided to dedicate my life to helping others overcome their truest fears, the things that haunt their nightmares, waking or asleep. After a few years of trial and error, I finally created a program that would surely help, at least that's what it was intended for. The reality of it turned out to be much more sinister. On July 8th, six people signed up for my new study. They were all healthy young adults who were eager to overcome their fears, while also looking forward to the generous lump sum of money that was offered as a reward upon completion. On paper, their fears were typical phobias. Nothing too out there. What I didn't expect was the lies that each of them told. I've kept their journals from the study, and I'll transcribe them below. Day one. I'm supposed to write in this journal for the results of some experiment put on by a psychologist. He runs this place and has this mirror that he thinks will expose me to my greatest fear have to say, I'm doubtful. He gave some explanation about the amygdala and the fear response in the brain, which I sort of understood from my psychology classes and random Google searches I've done. I'm a Googler. I was supposed to be writing down my experiences with my fear of germs. I have been diagnosed with your stereotypical OCD, cleanliness obsessions fueled by extreme germophobia. My host led me to the mirror expectantly and wiped off the white cloth cover with a flourish. In the mirror, I realized on the first glance how I looked like my father. A memory overlaid my vision momentarily. Spotless white floors, marred only by a spot of blood that had dripped unnoticed from my blistered hands. My father's disapproving face as he raised his belt one more time. His words echoed once more in my mind punctuated by further blows, words I dare not repeat that make me shrink inwardly as I did then as a child. A touch on my arm startled me out of my dazed state, yanking me back to the present. You all right, John? Do you have a journal? The question surprised me. I just told him I hadn't had one in years. A grin split his face as he walked to a cabinet and opened a drawer with several small books, journals, not identical, but similar enough. He grabbed one with an uneven black cover, with scales, and handed it to me. I decided not to ask why he would have multiple journals sitting around in a desk drawer. Write in it. I'd be interested to read what your experience is. So here I am, 
not feeling much different, laying on my bed while my wife Olivia sleeps. Day 2 I didn't sleep too well last night. My dreams were much the same as my memory that had risen as I looked in the mirror. I saw my father's face once more, but it was different than I had remembered. His face was contorted, but not in anger, but in terror. What could a man so terrible be afraid of? I'll write more later. 11.08 p.m., same day. I don't know what to say. My six-year-old son was being hyper and I have been plagued by constant pressure in my head. Some kind of migraine. Everything today seemed designed to piss me off. Bright lights, noise. It never seemed to end. Olivia was nitpicky. It finally hit a breaking point when Tyson wouldn't go to bed at eight, like he should. I found myself getting more and more angry. I feel like screaming now. Tyson was being so defiant and my anger only grew and grew until I ended up yanking him off the couch by his feet. He hit his head on the wooden floor of our living room. I stopped when I saw blood and he started crying. I sadly picked him up and carried him to his room. When Olivia asked why Tyson was crying, I told her that he had slipped and hit his head. Had I really hurt my own child, my own son? I laid on the floor feeling like retching the darkness from my soul. What was happening to me? This isn't about cleanliness at all. I had just lied to my own wife. Day 3 The guilt is overwhelming, but I can't stop myself from hurting my son when he disobeys. My wife never seems to take notice. The morning after I hurt him, he woke up and acted as if nothing had happened. When asked how he felt, he said, I don't feel so good. I better be more careful in the hardwood, it's so easy to slip. He didn't remember a thing. I'll admit I have begun hurting him more to see if he will remember. I want to get caught, to be punished for what I've done, for what I'm doing. But the consequences never seem to come. I killed a man. I was walking out at 3pm trying to run from the decay of my morals, running from the truth of my descent. I don't sleep anymore. The shame and desperation keep me awake all night. I saw a man walking and realized that if I was to be punished and stopped, I needed to do something more drastic. It was the only way. I took out my keys and in cold blood stabbed the man in the neck. I called the police to confess and held my bloody keys in hand until they arrived. I did it. I killed him. Take me away. They walked past me as if they didn't see me and rushed to the body. We need to find who did this. This was brutal. Nothing works. I am a monster. A ravenous wolf who walks among blind lambs. The things I have done to break this spell. I wish I could undo everything. My conscience is dull though. I should care, but I don't. The wind blows over the deep hole in my soul. I can almost hear a whistle howling. I killed my father. Now I realize the man at the Airbnb was right. I have faced my worst fear. It wasn't germs, or even general uncleanliness. After I shoved my father's head in the oven on high heat, his body thrashing, his face showed the pure terror that I had seen that first night after I hit my son. My fingers shake as I write this. I am not my father. I am much worse than he ever was. Day 1 I woke up feeling really heavy this morning. I had a bad dream again last night. I think it is the after effect of that weird experiment I went to yesterday. There was something off about that place. I shouldn't have volunteered, but I can't blame myself for it. Being a primary school teacher doesn't pay much. Volunteering for that science experiment, I earned a thousand bucks in 12 hours. I was all right when I came home that night. 
It was pretty late, so I skipped dinner as usual and went to bed. I wish I hadn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw myself trapped inside a huge glass box. I couldn't find a way out, and I am sure if I'm stuck in that box for a few more minutes, I'd have no oxygen to breathe. I tried to shout for help again, but nothing but air came out of my mouth. I felt helpless. I tried moving my hands, banging the glass wall. Again, nothing happened. It was a different level of anxiety. I felt like I was losing all my senses. This has to be my imagination, but how I feel right now is real in my mind. Suddenly, I heard a loud noise and wake up. It's 7 a.m. Day 2. I have to keep writing this journal. Things are getting crazier with each second. I am definitely hallucinating. Today, I saw a terrifying creature lurking in the corner of the classroom. I went to the teacher's washroom to splash some water on my face. When I opened my eyes, the water coming out of the tap was red. What the hell? I looked again and it, it was transparent. I looked at the mirror. I was shocked to see the monstrous creature behind my back. I looked back, it wasn't there. I looked in the mirror, again, there it was, looking right into my eyes. What was happening? Is this what he meant when he said you will face your deepest fear? I took the rest of the day off and went home. I was exhausted, but can't sleep. I am terrified of the suffocating feeling of being trapped and losing my identity. It's just like when I was dating John. He was too clingy and needy. It was as if I was losing myself into that relationship. I always thought I was better off alone. Whatever it is, I have to stay awake. I can't sleep. The creature is at my home. It's following me everywhere. Day three. It's dark again. I haven't slept in 72 hours. My eyes are burning, but I have to type how I feel right now. I don't think I can do this anymore. I'm losing my sanity. The creature is closer now. It was looking straight at me, waiting for me to go to sleep. Then it will eat my flesh. I can see its insatiable hunger in its eyes. I am not going to close my eyes. Shit! That fucking monster is in my bed. I might have closed my eyes for a sec. Oh my god, I don't think I'm going to make it. Now that it is closer, I see the shape of the creature. It looks like a wolf, but not a majestic one. It's thin, with lots of injuries on its body. There was flesh missing from its body like it had been scooped out. Every time I am taking my eyes off that monster and look at my laptop to type the journal, it feels like it's coming closer. Too close. I need to scare this thing away from me. I look around desperately to find something to protect me from the monster and by mistake, I look at the mirror. There's a man behind me. It's John with an ax in his hand. Day one, after so many years of suffering, I think I finally have a chance of having a happy birthday. The study wasn't as difficult as anticipated. I love what they did with the mirror. In all of my years of haunted houses, I've never seen anything like that. I'm excited at the prospect of looking forward to enjoying life instead of being afraid of it. Also, they gave me enough money to afford a down payment on a better car. First, I need to clean my house. 
I've been so busy, I haven't noticed how dusty it's become in here. My dog Rose has been sneezing like crazy. Day two. I'm not feeling as well as I'd hoped this morning. There's a weighted pain in my chest. Maybe I picked up something from one of the other subjects. That's the last fucking thing I need right now. It's like, hey, you aren't afraid of getting older anymore. Congratulations. Now we're going to put that to the test and make you feel like death. My eyes are playing tricks on me as well. This morning I walked by my mirror and had to do a double take. My crimson hair was smattered with silver. The smiling crow's feet around my eyes were deep valleys, facial reactions to fond memories. I raised both my hands to my face. It still feels fine, smooth as a baby's ass, in fact. However, the me in the mirror clutches at her face with gnarled fists. Liver-spotted hands grasp at paper-thin skin. Hands so broken and twisted that they aren't making fists at all. It's their natural state. Not knowing what else to do, I take my normal, straightened, spot-free hands and try to wash the image away with water. Maybe I'm hypersensitive because of the exposure therapy. At any rate, I look fine now, and there's still a lot to do. My house smells musty as fuck, it's turning my stomach. <laughs> Something's terribly wrong. I woke up to an aged bedroom. Yellowed wallpaper peeled at the corners and down the walls. Brittle bones creak with pained protests as I get out of bed. I call for Rosa, barely being able to hear my own voice. What is happening? In the corner of the room closet to my bedside table is a darkened heap. At first, I can't make out what it is, but upon closer inspection, I find the mummified corpse of Rosa. Every mirror in my house shows the same ancient image. Wrinkles plague my face. The heaviness in my chest is so much worse than it was yesterday. What did it do to me? I feel like a computer that's shutting down. One program at a time. Day one. I'm sitting here, staring at the page, trying to think of the best way to explain to you how I feel. The one thing that immediately comes up is anger. I guess that's the best way to put it. I'm pissed off about your fucked up experiment. I know I agreed to it, but I expected a few small centipedes in a normal room. Instead, you locked me in a room of mirrors filled with centipedes and they were not small. You must have found the biggest ones you could and stuck them in there with me. I begged you to let me out, and you ignored me. You said this would cure me of an irrational fear, but all I know is I curled up in that corner and I brushed those fucking centipedes off me as best I could until somebody came and got me, and I don't feel better. I feel fucked up, but the only way I get my money now is to write this. Just what was with those mirrors? 
Was it so I could watch myself piss my pants? I certainly do not feel cured. Only agitated and restless. I can still feel them crawling in me when I try to sleep. Day 2 It was a rough night and I am still pissed off about everything. But now I think that something might be wrong. I should have never agreed to this shit. I went into the bathroom this morning and as I brushed my teeth, I watched a centipede crawl out of my eye, taking my goddamn eye with it as it crawled down my face. A hallucination for sure. My eye is fine but later in the day, whenever I look into that mirror, I would hear a voice. It sounds like the voice of my father, but he's been in prison for over 10 years now and we have no contact. I don't know what he's saying. It's incoherent. Auditory hallucinations. I've just been ignoring them. You really messed me up here. Day 3 There's a centipede in the mirror. Yeah, in the mirror, not on it. It's not one that I can touch. It's like it's on the other side of a piece of glass. The ones that crawl on me in the mirror didn't scare me anymore. I can feel their legs skittering across my flesh, and they stop to take a bite out of me when they want. Maybe in some ways, I am cured of my fear of centipedes. The one in the mirror though, it's different. It's been speaking to me in my father's voice, telling me to do things that I do not want to do. Things that landed my father in prison and ended my mother's life. I try not to look at it, but it's always there on the mirror just yelling at me, telling me that I need to take action against those who wronged me. I feel sick, and I don't know how long I can deal with this thing yelling at me. Day 1 I was asked to keep a close record of the days following my session with the doctor, but I found it difficult to keep track of the days once I got home. I remember that I was trying not to feel too optimistic since I had tried several different kinds of therapy in the past, and they usually left me feeling more confident in my ability to conquer my fear of the dark. That, however, often proved incorrect as I quickly slipped into my previous mental state. Soon, it became clear that I had no cause for hesitation. I can't really say that I understand the curious treatment I was put through. I was rather skeptical of it, but I was in no position to say no. I would gladly spend an afternoon practicing breathing exercises in front of a mirror, no matter how silly I felt. All I wanted was to get rid of his crippling fear. I'm sure the other participants of this study have real issues to deal with and that my fear of the dark pales in comparison, but my fear wasn't normal by any means. Lights out will leave me on the verge of hysteria, but the mere thought of the absence of light gives me anxiety. A dark corner, a shadowy passageway, the open door to the basement stairs, each step being swallowed by blackness, one by one by one, until nothing else is left. It has ruined my life. Once I came home and night fell, however, I could tell that I wasn't afraid anymore. I stared into the long shadows being cast in the corner of my room and I took a deep breath. I felt no panic, no anxiety, not even the slightest hint of a tremor on the tips of my fingers. On the contrary, I felt in absolute peace, as if the absence of light not only didn't scare me, but also had become soothing. I was elated and told myself to pick up a pen and start writing down my report immediately. But I didn't. You see, the more I stared into the dark, 
the more I came to understand that the dark was looking back at me. Not a creature, not some spindly demon with red eyes and bad intentions. My imagination used to conjure up plenty of those to keep me company as I tried to fall asleep. I felt as if the darkness itself were looking at me, appraising me with a calculating stare. And though I knew I should have been terrified, I wasn't. Not because the darkness was kind. I could tell that it wasn't. Neither was it evil. It was simply inevitable. And I think I came to accept that. Day 3 I don't understand why I am not scared. Just three days ago, I would have shouted my lungs out at the mere sight of a flickering light. The harmless dark bore terrible demons within that reached out bony hands at night to grasp my ankles if I didn't have my bedside lamp on. They were slow but persistent, waiting for the chance to pull me away from the light and into their shark-like mouths. Dark corners hid unspeakable terrors and light was the only salvation. I had always been scared of the dark and the dangers it concealed, but now I know better. Now I know the dark hides nothing, it's only seeking me and, and I think it's beckoning me towards it, as if it wanted me to slip into the shadows. And I'm not afraid, fear is supposed to be a natural reaction to this, isn't it? But I think the treatment worked very well, because I feel none of it. So this is my one and only report, a testament to this treatment, a letter of gratitude. Once I am done, I don't think I will resist anymore. I think I've been running away from the dark for too long. It might be time to let it take me. Thank you for your help, Finn. Patient number six, Harley May. <sighs> Your shitty little science project has ruined me, and I will never forgive you for it. You must be out of your mind letting anyone partake in this experiment. Do you even know what you're doing? Do you even know what you're putting people up against? Day one. I was 100% on board with your cause. You told me you could help me with my self-esteem. To help me accept who I was. To help me feel comfortable in my own skin. I knew the experiment called for exposure therapy, but to just lock me up in a room with a mirror in it was senselessly cruel. At first, I panicked but there was nothing I wanted more than to be rid of my insecurities. To be able to look at myself and feel like me. So I sat down on the floor and looked at the mirror from afar. I made sure I was just far enough so as not to see my reflection. However, I had a sudden burst of indignation. Why shouldn't I look at myself? Maybe there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe the fact that there's nothing wrong with me is why I'm even here. Maybe this is the first sane decision I've made all my life. So, apprehensively, I made my way to the mirror and took a look at myself, and suddenly I liked what I saw. I couldn't look away. Day 2 I woke up in front of the mirror. I ate breakfast while looking at my reflection. Yeah, thanks for the stale donuts, by the way. Really fucking appreciated that complimentary breakfast you advertised. And halfway through the day, decided that I didn't hate myself. In fact, quite the contrary. My perspective had been skewed my entire life, and suddenly I was enjoying watching myself. I would smile into the mirror, make faces into the mirror. I wanted to see every moment I made. I loved it. It was like some engrossing movie I couldn't look away from, except I was the star. I loved the way the lights of the ceiling shone in my eyes. I loved the way dimples formed in my cheeks when I smiled. 
It was like I was truly seeing all of me for the first time. The mirror made me never want to look away. It was surreal, but comforting. At times I could barely tell which was me, the reflection, or the person looking at it. I was about to laud you as a genius until the next day. Day 3. I woke up looking at myself yet again. This time, however, it was not in the mirror. I was looking at myself looking into the mirror. When I stood up, I was watching myself stand up. When I walked around, I was watching myself walk around. My body turned to face the me that was looking at it, and I had a harsh derealization attack. It was like my perspective had changed to be outside my body. It hasn't stopped either. I have been stuck like this since your test. I watch myself do everything. Drive, cook, eat, and sleep. I am currently watching myself type this journal. Please, get back to me ASAP. Am I just doomed to watch myself in third person for the rest of my life? If I'm not me, and I'm just watching me, am I still even me? I don't even recognize the person I'm looking at anymore. As you can see, my mirror did in fact do its job. The only problem was that their true fears were much more sinister, and they were not ready to face them. I've anticipated this though, hence why the mirror was created. Humans lie. For most of them, by the third day, their subconscious got the better of them, and I'm saddened to say, they could not adjust. I still visit some of them in the psychiatric hospital, or the jail cells that they now reside in, but unfortunately, they're too far gone to save. I'm looking for six more subjects who will be honest and open with me about their fears and who are ready to face them head on. Any takers? Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Because this is October, I'm going to make this nice, short, and sweet. If you'd like to help support the show or the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. If you'd like to get yourself some new Halloween and Creepypasta-inspired teas, you can head over to etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And if you want to catch me... Creeps McPasta and Mew during our live Halloween tour around the southern U.S., head over to creepypasta.showfetti.com. That's creepypasta.s-h-o-f-e-t-t-i.com. Hang on to your hats, kids, because this year is a 31-day Halloween countdown. Happy Halloween and sweet dreams.